Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. This week's episode will for sure make you think twice about sleeping without a nightlight. Let's get into this week's stories and drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. In my town, everyone must be inside before sundown. I finally found out why. Written by Gussie the Best. When I was 14, my uncle announced to me that we would be moving to Wyoming. I'm not going to name the town for obvious privacy reasons. I was ready to move. Not because I was being bullied or anything like that. But I just wasn't a fan of the crowded population. And also, I wasn't a fan of the town. My mom was a single mom who gave birth to me from an anonymous donor. That part wasn't what made me hate the town. My mom was mugged and killed when I was seven, and her brother, my uncle, took me in. I didn't witness it myself, as I was staying with my uncle when it happened. He broke the news the next day. But I don't need your pity. I've long moved on from this and my uncle has become like my parent. He's not the stereotypical uncle character either. My uncle Matt was almost seven feet tall, muscular, had dyed purple hair and a faux hawk, green eyes stubble, and a pretty big tan. And he was really intimidating. However, his personality was and still is overall pleasant. He's very nice to me and is like a patient father to both his friends and family. He's also a retired military soldier from the Marine Corps, so he's quite tough. And although he's in his late 40s, he still looks like he's in his late 20s to early 30s. And despite his age, he keeps up with the modern day almost perfectly. So, he's not like an old man when trying to work a computer. He actually understands internet culture. Sorry, I'm going a little bit off topic. So, we arrived at our new house, and there was a welcome committee to greet us. Although strangely, they didn't want me in the same room as them and my uncle. When they left... My uncle had a dead, serious look on his face. He looked down at my 5'9 figure and warned me. Nathan, this might sound really weird, but stay inside after sundown. I was confused, but replied. Okay, Uncle Matt, I won't. He gave a smile and said, Good. Now let's finish setting up this place. Two years passed and things were going really well. I had made a lot of friends. And my uncle even got a new girlfriend named Amy around six months after moving in. Today, they are happily married. And I'm glad that I now have something similar to a mother figure in my life. I was 16 then, and that's when I made one of the biggest mistakes of my life. Curiosity had gotten the best of me after two years of not being allowed outside after sunset. That combined with me being young and dumb led me to break the rule and stay out. I had lied to my uncle saying that I was staying at a friend's house and that I was going to stay the night. I even faked text messages with my friend just to convince my uncle. I left and waited until the sun went down. 
I then went out onto the streets. All the businesses were closed and honestly, I was really tempted to rob the stores as there were no cameras around. But I came to my senses and I chose not to. The only place open from what I could see was the hospital. I then got out my ocarina and started to play an original song I made just for practice on it. So far, it was pretty boring. No cars were out, no people, nothing. I sat down on a park bench and began browsing through Instagram and messaging my online friends. I looked at the time. It was 9 p.m. In my exploration, I didn't realize that five hours had already passed. It was dark now and I honestly felt like sneaking back home through the window. But I knew that I would get my butt chewed out by my uncle and his girlfriend. So, I decided to try and sleep in the park for the night. I turned my phone off, tucked it underneath the bench, and then tried to go to sleep. That's when I heard a groaning noise. I startled awake, only to see that nothing was there. I stood up and grabbed my phone. I messaged one of my good school friends, Anthony, who has lived here since he was born, and said, Hey, I think I just heard something groaning outside. Everyone's supposed to be inside, right? A few seconds later, he replied, Ethan, you're not supposed to be outside right now. I was startled, as he wasn't supposed to know that I was outside. He then followed that up with, Promise me, promise me that if you see one of them, never look into their eyes. I was confused, but I shrugged it off, as him just trying to scare me for breaking the rules of the town. He was always like that. I began to walk around some more. And that's when I saw a faint pink glow from an alleyway. I approached it thoughtlessly and saw what I can only describe as something that didn't belong in this world. It wasn't the first time that I had seen something spooky. As I have seen stuff like white silhouettes before, which turned out to be just moonlight reflecting a certain way. This was the closest that I had ever gotten to something like that. In fact, if I hadn't skidded to a sudden halt, I would have knocked myself straight into it. I jumped behind a trash can nearby and watched the creature closely. It was at least eight feet tall and it had two large glowing eyes which were the light pink in color. It was so skinny, it didn't even seem to have any organs, just bones. The creature was a humanoid, with two long arms, with three joints each which moved like shoulders. Its hands were long, with all of its fingers being around 10 inches long, and at the same length, its skin was a bluish gray color and it lacked fingernails. Its feet were also thin and long and they lacked toes. At first, I thought that it didn't even have a mouth until I realized that its mouth was on its throat, right where a man's Adam's apple would have been. It didn't seem to notice me, and for some reason, I got an almost irresistible urge to look into its eyes. I couldn't help it. I had to get just one look into its eyes. I also couldn't help but admire the surreal beauty of the thing standing before me. That's when it cracked its head to look straight at me, 
It stood up, opened its mouth, and let out the most shrill and high-pitched screech I've ever heard. I turned and bolted out of there, but I heard the creature follow. My mind was racing with thoughts of what it would do if it ever caught up to me. I was terrified and didn't stop running. My lungs burned and my legs ached as though the ground was crushing them into pieces. But I didn't stop. All I could focus on was getting away from the abomination chasing me. I kept glancing behind me only to see it getting closer. I also saw other ones slowly appearing in the distance, seemingly searching for other humans outside. I then saw the one building open, the hospital. In desperation, I opened the door, practically leapt inside, and I slammed it shut again. The lady at the front desk saw my distressed face as I tried to catch my breath. Oh God, please tell me there's not one of them out there. We can't let any of them get inside. And then I heard that same groaning noise. I froze, panicked. The lady did too. I turned and saw the creature outside almost pressed against the door's glass. The only thing between me and the thing now was just a two-inch thick barrier, the door. I knew that the door was nothing to this beast, as it was almost two full feet taller than it. I stood up and then began to run towards the desk, and then the creature squatted down and then with full force, elbowed the door. The doors came crashing down as it got inside. I thought that this was it. I was going to die. My entire life flashed before my eyes as it stood right over me. And then my phone's ringtone went off. It was the same song I'd played on my ocarina earlier. I looked at my phone. My uncle was calling. The creature then recoiled and screamed, seemingly in either fear or shock, possibly both. I then knew what to do. I turned on my flashlight app and set it to constantly flash. I even took out my ocarina and blew into it, without any holes covered as hard as I possibly could. The thing... It then got on all fours and it dashed back outside as I heard its screams become fainter and fainter. The lady seemed horrified and rushed inside of the actual hospital and I assume she liked the doors in the entry. Soon, the sun began to come up and I ran as hard as I could back home, my mind racing. As soon as I got in, I saw that my uncle's girlfriend didn't seem too happy. I called your friend's mom, and she said you weren't there at all. Where the heck were you? She said. My uncle looked at her and said, Relax, babe. He's probably had a rough night. I just looked down and told them, Oh, you have no idea. What happened to you? My uncle said. I went outside and I, I saw one of them. Its face, its mouth, God, its eyes. I had to be calmed down for what felt like hours before I could even manage to tell them what happened. When I finally told them everything, I half expected them to call me a liar. But instead... My uncle looked completely shocked, while his girlfriend looked white as a sheet of paper. Ethan, I told you not to stay outside. You didn't listen. My uncle said he had a tone that was stern and anxious at the same time. Ethan, 
We didn't want you to know why, but now uh, I guess you do. Nobody knows what they are or where they come from, but what we do know is that they are never to be looked in the eyes. My uncle's girlfriend told me, Well, uh, I drove it off, didn't I? Yes, but never do it again. You understand me. Yes, uh, I won't do it again. I promise. I promise. I shouted. I had to go to therapy as I suffer from it after almost losing my life. I'm 19 now, and currently saving up to get as far away from here as possible. I still have no idea what those things were, but now I know that it was a good idea to stay inside after sundown. If only I knew why they wanted me inside. Beware the Ice Cream Man Who Comes in the Middle of the Night Written by Mike Jesus I wasn't meant to be outside. My parents were strict and I was far too young to refuse them. I always cleaned my room without a second warning. There wasn't a single chore that I had to be reminded of. I always followed my 8pm curfew. Yet there I stood, barefoot and shivering. It must have been well after 11. The village road lights had already been turned off, but there I was. Standing outside of the cottage with nothing but moonlight to keep the darkness away. If my father caught me, he would surely give me a beating. If my mother caught me, she would surely tell my father. My back ached at the thought of the danger that I was in. But regardless of how much I tried, my legs refused to move. Some invisible puppeteer was forcing me to stand outside in the middle of the night. At least I wasn't alone. Next to me, pale in the moonlight, stood Jeffrey, my best friend. Across the street, Maria, the girl with the perpetually angry mom, stared back at us. All of the village children were standing outside of their cottages, just as terrified as I was. I tried speaking to Jeffrey, and he tried speaking to me, yet when we opened our mouths, no words came out. All the children of the village stood by the road, their jaws snapping soundlessly, begging for help that would not come. Slowly, creeping with an echo through the valley, it came. Mr. Mobino's ice cream truck. Mr. Mobino was the only ice cream salesman who would come to the village. All the children loved him. The jingle of his ice cream truck would always herald in a moment of happiness into the monotony of rural life. His frozen treats would cheer us all up on the grayest of days. It wasn't just because of the ice cream that every single child would chase after his truck though. We loved Mr. Mobino because he wasn't like the other adults in our lives. He smiled and laughed and told us interesting facts about lizards, where our parents spoke of harsh winters and warned of a slim harvest. Mr. Mobino made us excited about the world that we lived in. He made every day exciting. He made every day sweet. The ice cream truck jingle grew too close to be mistaken. For a moment, I was certain that Mr. Mobino would jump out of the night and save us from whatever sleepwalking trance we had been lulled into. But when I finally saw the truck, all of my hopes of aid came crashing down. It wasn't the same truck I would wait for every afternoon. No, the truck that came riding through that village was completely different. Gone were the cheery ice cream advertisements and the calm blue paint of the truck. Instead, the truck was covered with pictures of bats and skeletons that looked like they were drawn by someone who hates children. The truck glowed in a sickly neon glow. It was almost as if it was surrounded by some horrid spores that fed on our fear. I didn't want to follow the truck. The sight of it made me so scared that I wanted to scream. But I couldn't scream. And whatever puppeteer controlled my legs refused to acknowledge my fear. I found myself walking behind the truck. I was not alone. 
More and more children joined in as we followed the glowing machine to the edge of the village. They were all trying to scream. They all wanted to go back to the safety of their own homes. Yet none of us could resist the call of the neon green ice cream truck. Once we had reached the edge of the village, the truck rode off into the nearby woods. Beneath the cover of trees, the moon and the stars had disappeared. We were all trapped in the darkness, with a single sickly light to guide us. The truck stopped. The children of the village shuffled themselves into a line. We moved towards the window of the truck one by one, just like we did every day when Mr. Mobino came to our village. Yet this time around, there was no laughter or cheers. We simply moved one by one, awaiting to be served in complete silence. And when I saw him, I tried to scream again, but all my throat could release was a hiss. The man leaning out of the truck barely resembled Mr. Mobino. His fancy mustache, his bushy eyebrows, they had all disappeared. Mr. Mobino's face was completely hairless, and his usual look of joy was replaced with a vacant stare. It wasn't Mr. Mobino that had frightened me, though. It was what he held in his hands. It wasn't ice cream. With no control over my hands, I took it. But it wasn't ice cream. Where once perfect scoops of creamy vanilla rested, something moved. The dim and green glow of the truck didn't provide much light, but I could see the bits of pulsing flesh in my cone. It wasn't ice cream. With no control over my hands, I took a bite, my mouth filled with the taste of iron. When I woke up the next morning, I felt horribly weak. Each breath that I took rattled through my lungs. I felt like I was nothing but skin and bone. Every bit of my body wanted to stay in bed, but my mind was frenzied by the events of the night. I nearly broke my back running down the stairs. My parents were strict, but I had no qualms telling them about what happened the night prior. When I rushed into the kitchen, however, the words would not come to me. I stood in front of my mother and father with my jaw wide open, unable to speak. At first, I was scared that I had gone completely mute, but when my mother asked me if I wanted breakfast, the ability to speak suddenly returned to me. The answer to her question was no. There was something horribly wrong at the pit of my stomach. Food was the last thing on my mind. I made a couple more attempts to communicate what had happened the night prior to my parents, but I once again found myself speechless. Things were no better at the schoolhouse. When I tried to speak to Jeffrey or to Maria, or to any of the other kids that were witness to the neon green ice cream truck, the words simply wouldn't come. We were all aware of what had happened the night before. The reality of the nightmare was unavoidable in our eyes, yet we couldn't speak about it. During lunch, it was impossible to eat. The thought of chewing, of swallowing, of consuming any form of nutrition... It was downright revolting to me. My body refused any idea of food. Even the mere thought of it made me gag. Yet somewhere in my core, an insatiable hunger festered. My body didn't crave food. It craved something else. As the school day carried on, that relentless longing grew stronger and stronger. Beneath my teeth, I could feel the gentle pulse of a foreign heartbeat. My spit tasted of iron. I wasn't the only one who was suffering. All of my classmates, all the children who had walked through the woods with me the night before, they all looked just as horrid as I did. Skinny shells of once happy kids with thick spit bubbling at the edges of their labs. Unable to verbally acknowledge what was happening and with nothing better to do, once the final bell rang, me and Jeffrey did what we always did after school. We went to play with the wooden swords that our fathers had made for us. Yet as we stood out on the village road, swinging our splintery sabers, we weren't kids enjoying the land of make-believe. We were two creatures of flesh and bone, dripping mucus from our mouths, brandishing weapons that could not defeat what plagued us. 
and we swayed back and forth with our toys, trying to recapture the spark of childhood innocence that Mr. Mobino took out. Then, from the valleys beyond the village, came a familiar echo, the cheery jingle of the ice cream truck. I wanted to run away. From the sheer look of terror in his eyes, I could tell that Jeffrey wanted to run away as well. But regardless of how scared we were, we both stood still. As the discomforting ice cream music grew closer, the other children of the village had left their cottages and stood outside, just like they did the night before. No one wanted to be there. The fear in that patch of road was palpable. We all wanted to scream. We all wanted to run away yet. When Mr. Mobino's truck rolled into the village, like desperate rats to the Pied Piper's flute, we all followed the truck. There was no laughter. There were no jokes. Mr. Mobino simply pressed the ice cream cones into her hands one by one and then drove off. His demeanor was completely different, but it wasn't just Mr. Mobino that had changed. On first glance, the ice cream looked just as creamy and delicious as it always had, but there was something wrong with it. My hands acted independent of my body. I had no choice in the matter of consuming the ice cream, yet just as the frozen treat approached my dripping lips, I saw it. Beneath the flakes of ice and vanilla, the scoops of ice cream moved. As my quivering tongue pressed against the ice cream, I could feel a heartbeat. The once delicious notes of milk and sugar were gone. The ice cream tasted of spoiled milk and metal. With each forced lick of the unsettling cone, the implacable craving that had been brewing in my chest disappeared. Yet its absence didn't make me feel any better. It simply fortified the exhaustion in my young bones. I went to sleep early that night hoping that the past day was just a momentary partying with reality. This wasn't the first time that my childish mind had gripped onto the unknown and suffered from it. My personal history was filled with monsters under beds and men hiding in shadows. Shortly after the September 11th attacks in America, I even found myself certain that the guy was hiding in the woods and near our village. I hoped that the ordeal with the ice cream man was just another byproduct of my colorful imagination. I went to sleep early that night, hoping that I would wake up to a world that I could understand. By midnight, those hopes were crushed to dust. I wasn't meant to be outside. None of the kids were meant to be outside. Yet there we were, just like the night prior, scared, shivering and without a shred of control over our bodies. He led us to the woods with his truck shining through the night. He forced us to feast on a still living flesh. By the time the sun rose, nothing had changed. None of us could eat. All the children in the village looked like prisoners who had gone on hunger strikes. We were all miserable husks of who we once were, but none of the adults would acknowledge the change. They just yelled at us for not eating and being lazy. Time stretched itself into a vague mirage of life punctuated by the painful visits from the ice cream man. During the night, he would feed us bloody flesh. During the day, he would feed us flesh poorly disguised as ice cream. Each meal we were forced to eat simply made us hungrier. Day by day, Mr. Mobino's grasp on the village children grew into a suffocating stranglehold. We all bore the signs of starvation. We were all trapped in a horrid ritual of Mr. Mobino's making, yet all the adults in our lives were blind to it. All the adults, with the exception of one old crone. It could have been a week after Mr. Mobino's transformation. It might have been a month. My perception of time was non-existent by then. The only thing that stood out to me were the visits of the demented ice cream man, and the scolding my parents would give me for sleeping all the time. All that I remember is that it was a foggy day, and I was shuffling my way to school. Help! Came a weak voice from the curtain of white. Please, if someone can hear me help, I I've fallen and can't get up. Every muscle in my body ate. The last thing I wanted was to be disciplined with a ruler for being late to the schoolhouse. 
Yet as I heard the frail voice, I followed it. At first, I was scared that I was once again ensnared in the service of some invisible puppet master. Yet as I walked, I realized that I still had control over my body. Please, gentle souls, anyone who can hear me, the creaky voice cried. Please come and help an old woman who can't help herself. I followed the voice, not because I had to, but because I knew what it was like to be trapped in need of help. She looked exactly like the old woman who would show up an hour early in the church and sing their prayers over the priest. Yet she differed in two aspects. She was much older. Even though the old women of the village were well in their 80s, they looked like young maidens compared to the old crone that lay in the fog. The skin on the hag's face was so lifeless, so wrinkled and worn, that it seemed like she shouldn't be alive. The second thing that made the hag different from the old woman at the village were her eyebrows. Cosmetics are a rarity in rural life. There is something to be worn during celebrations by the young, if ever worn at all. Yet lying there by the side of the road, the strange woman's eyebrows were painted a dark bloody shade of red. Uh, a peasant boy, she said. Would you be so kind as to help an old woman up? The sight of the obviously fake crimson paint on the untouched ancient skin made me uncomfortable, and my tired muscles could scarcely hold up my arms. But without a second thought, I helped the woman up. Ah, uh, thank you, little peasant boy, she said, not letting go of me. May the forest bless you, little peasant boy. May the forest bless you. She wrapped her sagging arms around me and squeezed me in for a hug. For someone who wasn't able to get off the floor on her own, the hag showed remarkable strength. For a moment, it even seemed like my brittle bones would not stand the firmness of her embrace. But eventually, the hag relented. My apologies, little peasant boy. I didn't mean to scare you. It has simply been a long time since I felt the warmth of young flesh. No one wants to touch an old wrinkly maid like me. Thank you for your help. And now you go on and... Her sparsely toothed smile faded. The thick fake eyebrows rumpled into a concerned look. Uh, young peasant boy, it would seem as if I was not the only one in need of aid here. Your arms, your eyes, I can see it as clear as day. You have been the victim of a malevolent spirit. She watched me with her one good eye, tracing the edges of her sickly lips with a crooked finger. That won't do, she finally said, reaching into her coat. It wouldn't be right to leave a young man with a pleasant heart without help. Out of her coat, she produced a pendant with a tiny blue stone in its center. Here, take this little peasant boy, an amulet of my own making. It will shield you from the forces of evil. Put it on and you'll be protected from any spirit that might mean you harm. The old crone made me uncomfortable, but there was the gentlest hint of sweetness in her tone. Without thinking twice, I took the pendant and put it on. I wanted to thank her for the gift, but instead, I screamed. I screamed in an uncontrollable burst of glee. As soon as the jewelry had touched my neck, an inarticulable wave of joy spread through my body. The exhaustion, the pain, the craving... All the things that had burdened me since the night Mr. Robina led me out into the forest were gone. I felt like myself again. Profusely, I thanked the old crone, but she simply laughed. No need to thank me. You have earned your reward with your kind deed. Now run off. Run off before I ask for something else in return. And when I came to the schoolhouse that foggy afternoon... I was ecstatic to tell all the village children about the old crone and how she had helped me, yet they had no ears for my words. As I spoke, all they responded with were blank stares. For a moment, it almost looked as if Jeffrey would have something to say, yet when he opened his mouth, only drips of sticky mucus came out. They were all still wrapped up in whatever horrid curse that Mr. Mombino had laid upon them. The other village children couldn't celebrate with me in their current state, but I knew that would not last. I knew that with the help of the amulet, I would free them of the curse. During lunch, I was the only child who touched their food. 
I had never been a fan of the meals that the schoolhouse had served yet, with my taste back, with my appetite back. Even the bland mashed potatoes tasted like heaven. Even though my body was under my own control once more, and my skin no longer clung to my bones, I still felt weak from the weeks of starvation. I took a big lunch. I knew that I would need my strength to defeat Mr. Mobino. That afternoon, I waited by my window with bated breath. The amulet had protected me from that horrible craving. It made me feel whole again. But I needed to be sure that I would be protected from whatever trance Mr. Mobino would put the village children into. I watched as all of my friends followed the ice cream truck to the edge of the village. I watched them all eat that pulsing flesh disguised as a frozen treat. I watched the village children suffer, safe in the knowledge that I would be able to help them. I went to sleep while the sun was up that day. I went to sleep early, because I knew I would need all my energy to defeat Mr. Mobino. When the ice cream truck showed up again that night, I joined the procession of brainwashed kids as they marched into the forest. Even though my legs were full of energy and my mind was clear, I did my best to match the pace of the other children. When Mr. Mobino walked out of the truck to serve the ice cream, however, I snuck off into the darkness. As he handed out those bloody bits of poison, I snuck into the ice cream truck. I was far too young to know how to drive, but I had sat next to my father as he worked the tractor enough times to have a general idea of how to operate a vehicle. I took a deep breath and pressed my foot down on the gas pedal. Thud. I hit Mr. Mobino. Crack. The heavy ice cream truck made quick work of his bones. Thud. The job was finished. I pulled the handbrake and leaped out of the truck. I was expecting the rest of the village children to cheer for me. I did defeat the evil ice cream man that was forcing us to eat flesh after all. Yet they didn't. They didn't seem happy. They seemed confused. They were all looking at Mr. Mobino's body. He's dead, guys. Can't you see? I saved you all, I yelled. All the children looked much healthier than before, but they were still terrified. When he opened his mouth, a bunch of spit slid out, but eventually Jeffrey managed to speak. I don't think Mr. Mobino is dead. He wasn't. The ice cream man's body started to twitch. The green hue from his truck grew brighter than a spotlight. In that blinding light, I saw Mr. Mobino's body transform. His arms popped out of their sockets. His jaw morphed into a monstrous maw. The clothes he wore ripped beneath the strain of his new flesh. He was no longer the friendly ice cream man we grew up with. He was no longer a man. Before us stood a giant beast. Its single yellowed eye darted through the crowd searching for me. Mr. Mobino's two human arms split into a octet of dripping tentacles, which floated around looking for a target to grab. The beast's jaws snapped with anger, bloodying themselves in the process. The bigger the monster grew, the brighter the neon glare of the truck got. The silhouettes of the other children scattered through the rays of green. I see you, the beast boomed. I see you and you will pay for what you've done. If it wasn't for my big lunch, if it wasn't for the nap that I took, I would have not been able to jump out of the way of the beast's lunge. Yet, with my energy reinvigorated, I was able to jump away in the nick of time. The beast raised its horrid maw, spitting away bits of earth and blood as it rode again. Its flesh pulsed with unspeakable power. I knew that I could not defeat the creature on my own. Yet, just as hopelessness was about to set in, I noticed that the neon light stemming from the ice cream truck was beating in tandem with the pulsing monster's body. The truck was the source of power for the horrible creature. As the beast raised its maw to once again leap at me, I did the only thing that I could think of. I slid under the truck. With one swift motion, the abomination that was once Mr. Mobino wrapped its jaws around the truck and swallowed it whole. With even greater intensity, the beast roared once more. But then it stopped. 
As if something had been caught in the monster's throat, the angry roar soon turned into a choked whisper. The creature threw itself from side to side in a furious last effort to destroy me, but I was quick on my feet. With every blind lash of its long appendages, with every missed bite with its massive maw, the beast grew smaller and smaller until it ceased to exist. With my work done, I started to make my way home alone. When I got outside of my cottage, however, I found a crowd of children waiting for me. Thank you for saving us, Jeffrey said, and then he hugged me. Years later, when I bump into anyone from the village where I grew up, we always compare notes on how life in the wider world has been. Some of us have been successful, some of us haven't. Some of us have big families and some of us don't. Some of us are happy and some of us struggle. But one thing is universal. None of us have ever touched any ice cream since the night Mr. Mobino took us out into the woods. There is a scavenger hunt in the London underground that is not what it seems. Written by Kyle Harrison My Men Urban Explorer A modern day roamer, if you will. Been doing this since my 21st birthday. Thanks to my best friends Nick and Joe introducing me to the vast underground network of abandoned tunnels that covers almost all of London. There hasn't been a moment of my free time that I haven't spent in that darkness. To me, the grime and the filth and the decay are testament of history. We as explorers get the chance to step backward at a time and see forgotten parts of our civilization when we do. It's beautiful and haunting. It's a part of me that I never thought that I would need to give up. But then Nick had an accident. One dive into a twisting part of a railway tube that had been closed off for the greater part of 30 years led to him being trapped under debris for almost six hours. We had to contact paramedics to come down there and to pry him out, which was a whole other ordeal. They managed to get him out, but also fined him for unauthorized entry into a quarantined area. He lost both of his legs and all of his dignity. Needless to say, he was never the same after that. Joe said after that that he didn't have the drive for exploration anymore. I know we have always respected the fact that this stuff is dangerous, but man, seeing what happened put things into perspective for me. I have a wife now, a kid on the way. I don't think I'll be going down there again, he admitted. Gradually, I moved on as well, trying to forget about that part of my life. It's hard though, to give up something that you love. I realized just a few weeks back that I still hadn't forgotten because I saw a flyer on one of the side rails leading into the tube that instantly sparked my interest. For the unsuspecting passerby, it likely looked just like a dozen other adverts that covered these subway walls like graffiti. But I recognize the telltale signs of Urbex. There is a picture of one of the abandoned stations that I had visited before, followed by an enticing offer to participate in a scavenger hunt for a prize. Come to this location for more details. The message read, The prize was said to be at least 20,000 quid, a pretty penny in these trying times to say the least. I decided to check it out that day after work. Getting there was half the battle. I had to get off at a station alone and had to bribe one of the railway officers to let me go anyway. 
and ain't nothing down that way. You'll just be going in circles, mate, he told me. Then it's my money to waste, isn't it? I told him. I wanted to give myself a boost of confidence to keep going. Part of me actually wondered if this was some sort of scam. But another part of me suspected that this was likely a game runner for an internet sensationalist. And that made me even more interested. These sorts of puzzles were what attracted me to the intrigue of urban exploration in the first place. Soon, I was in the abandoned station. It was amazing to me to see how quickly the contrast between the orderly and modern tube and this old tunnel. I was back to my old roots. I walked a ways further, my smartphone casting light into the gloom as I made my way up to the platform. In ages gone by, a subway trolley would have picked up passengers here, but now it was only covered in trash and decay. Then I heard a noise. Who goes there? I said instinctively, shining my light toward the sound. A younger woman raised her hands up defensively. Don't shoot, she shouted. And then she saw that I was in a cop and commented, Oh, you must be here because of the flyer too. I relaxed a bit, realizing she was an explorer like me and commented, are we the only ones here? So far, and I've been trying my best to find this first clue, but so far, all I've found is dusty footprints. She said, shining her own phone near the part of the platform where she had been standing. Those look pretty old, but maybe the hunt isn't about finding items. Maybe we have to take pictures of things and then send them to that QR code. I suggested. I showed her that I had taken a picture of the flyer and explained. That little square at the bottom takes you to this supposedly blank website. But I bet if we uploaded a picture that we made it here, maybe it would supply us with the next clue. That's pretty smart, she said. We did it and just as I had anticipated, our next location popped up. This one didn't look familiar at all. In fact, it looked a lot more ancient than where we stood now. Oh, that's not far from here, but we will have to do a bit of splunking, the girl said and offered me her hand and said, I'm Claire, by the way. I guess we are partners in this mess now. Jessica, I offered back as I checked my battery life. I hadn't anticipated being down here so long, perhaps hoping the next hunt site would be in a different tunnel entirely, and I started to inwardly panic. Flashbacks of Nick popped into my head as well. I didn't want to wind up down here with no chance of rescue. No one would even know I was here, I thought anxiously. But the intrigue of this mysterious game was too interesting. So I let my judgment lapse, and followed Claire toward an open hole in the desolation. It's a long way down, Jess. Buckle up. She advised as she tied the rope to a piece of old steel, and shimmied down into total darkness. I slid my phone into my pocket and wrapped the rope around my waist to get down as well, trying my best to not be concerned that... I was being led into a pit by a complete stranger. I've done this a thousand times before with Nick and Joe. I told myself as I tried to see where I was going. But it wasn't possible. I felt like the void was going to last forever. And then I had the brilliant idea to try and use my phone for light again. That was sarcasm because as I reached for it, my cell fell down below, and I heard it snap in half on the concrete. Claire, I hope that didn't hit you, I said as I hurried down to find her, but there was no response. I stood there in the dead silence, 
and waited to see if she would respond after a few more calls. And then in front of me, her smartphone lit up and I held my breath. Someone had knocked her out, leaving the stranger in a crumpled mess with her phone trying to dial 911. Except that I soon saw there was no signal down here. I took the phone and used it to look around, desperate to see if I could identify Claire's attacker. All I could see was a figure, standing at least six feet tall in the gloom. It was enough to make me scream in shock as I decided to run. Immediately though, I second guessed that plan. If I went further down this path, I had no idea if I would ever get out again. I turned around to face the stranger and decided to try and bluff my way out. Don't come any closer. I, I have a weapon, I shouted. All I heard in response was laughter. And then I realized that the shadowy figure was not alone. First, I saw two tall shadows moving forward, and then that split apart, and I realized that there was at least half a dozen tall men. They circled Claire's body, and I watched in paralyzed fear as they tried to come toward me. My only option was to hide. I turned off her phone immediately and felt around the corridors of the tunnel until... I found a bit of debris to crouch under her. I could hear them talking amongst themselves, a dastardly plan being revealed as they talked about us. How many others did you see? One man asked gruffly. I saw a girl go this way, but she might have gone into the next tunnel. It's a maze down there, the second said. Dang it. We need to get this supply back to the boss by nightfall. Well, uh, we should get cover again. There might be other people coming down here from the flyer. The first man said. Take the one out the back way. I'll keep searching. We need to make sure that that blood is cleaned up before the next batch comes in. The third man said. I held my breath. They were going to take Claire, and if they found me, likely do the same. Possibly to be sold off into something the way that they were talking. It made me sick to my stomach to imagine that they used the hobby that I loved to trap people just like me. I placed my hands down on the ground, searching in the darkness for something to defend myself with and I finally grabbed a hold of a sharp rock. And then my other hand touched one of the men's boots. I froze, hoping that maybe he wouldn't realize that it was me below in the shadows. Hey, I found her, he shouted. Instantly, I struck, slamming the rock against his leg. You son of a... I crawled off from my hiding spot and kept the rock in my hands, watching as several men ran toward me with large searchlights on their ways to guide them. They came here expecting untrained and innocent tourists. It was now my chance to rescue Claire and show these idiots a thing or two. I kept the rock close to my face and swung my fist randomly, jabbing and bashing against them as I kept running toward Claire. Truth be told, in the darkness I had no clue where I was going or what I was even heading. I kept hearing them shout and cuss as I didn't stop swinging. My mind flashed into Nick and wondering what he would do if he were here. Then the last one fell and I used their searchlight to find Claire. Carrying her close to me, I looked toward the cramped entrance where the men had come from and started to limp with her body weight against me. The next corridor was even more run down than where we had been trapped at, 
a slope of trash and debris that had clearly been sliding downward for years. It looked like it was about to cave in. I carefully held on to my new friend as we climbed, holding the phone out in front of me for light and hoping to get a signal. Then finally, a single bar showed up and I made a call to emergency services. What is your emergency? The paramedics asked. Hello? Hello? My friend and I are trapped in the London tubes, deep under the city. I, I, I don't know where we are and... I paused as I pushed for the GPS location and I sent it to the authorities. I've sent you our location. There are people here trying to hurt us. Please hurry, I said. I heard behind us the men starting to wake up and come towards us. I couldn't stop climbing. I couldn't look back. We actually didn't meet the police until we arrived at the main subway. They couldn't find a way down. We had come out through an old sewer line. Altogether, there were six men they arrested, all connected to these same disappearances just like I had suspected. I have no idea how many people they managed to capture before we came along, but sometimes when I'm traveling across London, I will see those flyers and it fills me with rage. I toss them and shove it under my boot. But I know that it may never be enough. I took a DNA test. Now I'm on the run for my life. Written by Sci-Fi Writer 3592 I was adopted by an American couple but I was born in Mexico. I never really felt a connection to either side though. We never celebrated nor participated in any of my Mexican heritage, nor did I feel welcomed into the American ideals. I grew up in a small town in Kentucky and was basically an outcast because I was essentially a stranger to them. I was kind of a loner, no friends, a cordial relationship with my parents but I was content. I had a home, food, and comforts here and there. Yet I had so many questions about my family history that I knew couldn't be answered, as my parents didn't really have much information to offer. I was found abandoned on the footsteps of some church in Jalisco. But there was that yearning to find my biological family, or at least some semblance of my family history. So, for my birthday... I asked for one of those kids. I can still remember our conversation. Sweetie, are you sure about this? My mother asked. Yeah, we just don't want you coming in with unrealistic expectations. My father interjected. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I remember replying. No matter what though, you guys are my parents and my actual family. I don't have any expectations, honestly. If I think my biological family is not what I was looking for, I'll just move on. I need this, please, I pleaded. God, I was so dumb. Eventually, my little spiel got into their heads and further encouragement from my therapist solidified my parents' agreement. I got the kit itself sometime during February. It was nothing special. The instructions just said to spit into the vial and chip it out and I would get my results in a couple of weeks. I remember the wait for my results. I tried to hide my excitement, but every night I would imagine this scenario, where I would end up related to someone really cool and famous or whatever. Every night I would check my email in hopes that it would come in early. And then one morning, I awoke to see the message. Congratulations, your reports are ready for viewing. If you have any questions, please call the number below. I quickly logged onto the website to see my profile. There was a global map with the highlighted countries where you had possible ancestry. 
In my case, every country was highlighted. I had such a small ancestry from every possible location on the map, but there was a chunk with 20% that was left untraced. As interesting as that part was, I was more interested in the relatives section. I've heard of people finding up to hundreds of different relatives, even if they were far removed. But upon clicking the relatives section, all I got was the message, no relatives available. You can imagine my disappointment. I spent the entire day pretty disheartened, and my parents had tried to cheer me up that day, but it felt like there was a piece in me that questioned if I was going to be truly alone in this world. I'm not disparaging my parents or anything, but at the time, I believed that blood meant something. That Saturday, I finally decided to put all that aside and go out to dinner with my parents. We went to a cute little diner and just sat there talking about the next steps. Sweetie, I got into contact with a private investigator. His name is Jason and I forgot his last name, but it was something Russian. My mother insisted. How did you forget his last name already? My father interjected. Is that the point, Richard? My mother replied. Wait, you guys would really do that? Isn't that kind of expensive? I asked. Nick, sweetie, don't worry about the cost. I just want you to stay focused on your grades and we'll make sure to find your parents or any relatives. I already gave all the information to the PI, and he said that he would get into contact with us soon. Wait a minute, how do we know he didn't just take the money and run? My father questioned. Because he didn't charge us just yet. And besides, I looked through his reviews and asked around and he got glowing recommendations. I felt like a total spy meeting up with him. My mother giggled as she held up a glass of wine and sipped it. The rest of the night went by smoothly, and we called it a night once my mother was a little tipsy. As we passed red light after red light, I couldn't help but notice this black SUV trail us on the way back. Ordinarily, it wouldn't have caught my eye, but once we had made our fifth turn, it did raise my eyebrow. But right as we pulled into our driveway, it drove past our house. We lived on the outskirts of the town and our road was another way in and out of the town, so I chalked it up to a mere coincidence. Although our part of town was more secluded, it wasn't all that uncommon for cars to pass by. The morning after, we went about our usual Sunday and went to Mass. As usual, the priest ranted about another problem plaguing our world, and it would have been another usual Mass service but I noticed that we had received new people in our congregation. A very old, shriveled-up man in an elegant tan suit sat right next to a pretty blonde in a gorgeous sundress at the very last pew. They made the rest of us seem like we were beggars dressed in rags. The man had a strange tattoo on his neck, which wouldn't have been visible, but the collar of his shirt was slightly open, exposing it even more. At the end of the Mass... My parents wanted to go up and introduce ourselves, but when we turned around, they were gone. That's kind of weird, my dad pointed out. Oh, maybe they're just shy. If we see them next week, we'll invite them over for dinner or something. My mother insisted before going off to speak to the other members of the congregation. We were there for a while and eventually I got bored, so I went to go wait in the car. As I sat in my dad's car... I couldn't help but notice the same couple sitting in the same black SUV that trailed us the night before. Or at least I thought it was the same car. Right as I was about to take a closer look, my car door swung open. Sweetie, could you hold this bag? I went to the shop across the street and got a bag of bagels and they're quite warm. My mother said hastily while giving me the brown paper bag. I turned around to take another look but they were already pulling out and going down the street. That night, I stayed up pretty late, doing some last-minute project, when I remembered that I was supposed to take the trash out to the curb. The garbage truck was going to pass by in the morning, and so I put my shoes on, and quickly went outside to pull it out. Our house was surrounded by trees with a single road coming up to our driveway. As obstructive as the trees were, I could still get a glimpse of the main road and the faint outline of that same black SUV. 
it was just part facing our way. As it began to get closer, its headlights turned on and they drove away. I wanted to tell my parents, but it was three in the morning, and I didn't feel like waking them for something that I had no evidence of. Besides, I didn't think they would have been able to do anything. God, I wish I had. The next day, I went to school and went about my day. By third period, I was in the middle of a test when there was a knock on the classroom door. The principal stood there with a dean talking on his walkie-talkie. He motioned for the teacher to step outside with him, and the dean came in, hushing us to be silent. Focus on your exams. He said quietly while looking down at his shoes while avoiding eye contact with anyone. Nicholas Johnson, the teacher asked loudly. I could feel every eye on me as I looked over at both of them. Could you come out here for a second? She asked in a weird tone. I started to get up, feeling awkward that everyone had suddenly remembered my existence. Oh, and bring your stuff with you, baby, she quickly added. I stepped outside with my things and started to follow the principal and the teacher herself, our footsteps echoing through the quietness of the hallway. We stepped inside of the cold office where a brunette woman in a black blazer was sitting. They motioned for me to take a seat while they all sat down. There's no easy way for us to say this, but there was a fire at your home this morning, the woman spoke. Unfortunately, there were no survivors. Both of your parents had passed away. I'm sorry. And with that sentence, I felt the world stop. It was as if everything had gone silent before coming down and crushing me. I am truly sorry. The woman said while well, everyone else in the room stood quiet. Is there anyone we could call? I shook my head. My Uncle Bernard is the only one, but we haven't seen him in years, and I don't know his number. I didn't add that I also didn't really want to see him. Considering the last time we saw him, he was off on a drug binge. He was a former veteran that resorted to unsavory medications. The woman nodded before handing me a tissue. Here, wipe your tears away and we'll figure this out, okay? I just nodded and took the tissue. I didn't even realize that my eyes were teary. So what do I do now? Where am I going to stay? I asked. Well, uh, because you still haven't turned 18, you'll be placed in a group home temporarily. That's actually where I will be taking you as of today. Once we get there, we will discuss all the details and get into contact with your parents' attorney. Is that okay? No, it wasn't okay that my parents were dead. Now my house was burned down, but I merely nodded. She discussed a few more details and the teacher along with the principal, escorting me out into her Prius. After a couple of hours, we ended up in an ugly and gray facility. It seemed more like a prison, to be honest. There were big steel gates blocking the front road. This seems a little extra for a group home. I said looking around to see if there was anything around. It looked like it was even more secluded than our town. Come to think of it, our town was small. But it wasn't that small where we had to drive hours away for a group home. Don't worry. It's perfectly safe and your parents' attorney will probably be inside. She reassured me. Wait, did my parents even have an attorney? I asked. A court-appointed social worker will be arriving soon. She said, pulling up to the gate which automatically opened. It was as if they were already waiting for us. Once we stepped inside, I realized the place looked strange. It actually did look like a prison. There was a front desk and several men in security uniforms walking around. The woman emerged from a nearby door holding some kind of hospital gown out for me to take. Here, you will change into these in that room over there. There will be a basket where you can put your personal possessions into and come out when you're ready. She stated in a hurry. I went into the room to change. It was rather small, no bigger than one of these store dressing rooms and there was a small metal bin where I put my clothes and my bag. I put my phone into the side of my boxer briefs though. There was no way I was going to put that into the bin. The gown was baggy enough to hide it. No social worker, but there was something too strange about all this. 
I stepped out of the dressing room, and before I knew it, guards came out of the sides, grabbing out of my arms. I tried to fight them, but the woman pulled a syringe and stuck it in my neck. After that, I blacked out. I woke up in a tiny empty room, like a psych ward. I was in a straitjacket and the room was all padded up. Where was I, and what was going on? I tried to wiggle and feel my phone, but I realized that it must have been taken by them. Dang it. Hey, let me go. I don't know who you are, but I have rights. Let me out of here. I yelled out, trying to bang on the door. Hey, can you shut up? A muffled voice yelled out. Who's there? I responded. I'm next door. So you can't see me, but there's a vent in the ceiling that carries your voice. They spoke. It sounded like a male, but I wasn't too sure. Why are we in here? Oh. Oh, I asked. Are you new? He asked. New? New to what? What's your name? He asked. Nick. Nicholas Johnson. Oh, that's a new name. I haven't heard of a Nick. What kind of person has never heard of a Nick? That's the most basic name there is. My name, well, official name is Test Subject 1830, but you can call me Jack. Test Subject? What do you mean, Test Subject? What is this? Oh, this is a collective facility. I'm not too sure about all the details, but they track and gather anyone with a special DNA. Special? Yeah. So, you know how there were different types of human species like Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and that last one, which I never learned the name of. Something like Denovan. Small humans. Barely. Didn't they go extinct like thousands of years ago? Well, sort of. And they disappeared, but there are still traces of them in our DNA. Well, that depends on the population. Anyway, there was another species of humans known as the Anunnaki. They weren't anything special and they went extinct as well. Okay, so what does that have to do with me? Well, so the standard DNA is made up of four sugars. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. These combinations make up our genes. But the Anunnaki had another sugar molecule or something like that called abramine. Abramine? Yeah, it's undetectable unless you know what you're looking for. The general public doesn't even know about it. Only the collective has information about it and they keep it very tight-lipped. So how do you know about it? I've lived here all my life, well, most of it. I think I was born somewhere in the Philippines. I barely have any memories of that place, though. Every time they harvest for me, I forget more and more. What do you mean, harvest? Harvest. They need to extract some of our bone marrow and utilize these cells or something like that. I'm not sure. Harold always gets fuzzy with the explanations. Sometimes I feel like he tries to confuse me. Or maybe he's confused himself. Harold? Yeah, Dr. Rigo. He's the guy in charge of the extractions. I've known him since I was little. How old are you? I'm not sure. I asked Harold once and he said somewhere between the age of 18 to 20. So when do we get out or when does this end? Uh, it doesn't. What do you mean? But before he could finish his sentence, my door swung open, and a couple of security guards burst in. Once again, I tried to fight back, but they stuck me with whatever it was that was knocking me out. When I woke up this time, I was lying in a hospital bed with several restraints. Whatever it was they were giving me was making me weaker and weaker. I looked around and saw that I wasn't alone. There was a giant light on top of me, like those of a dentist office. The room was dark, but I could make out a large glass mirror with several people standing behind it. One of them was that same pretty blonde woman who I saw at the mass service, and there were several others standing around with her, including the man who came to the service with her, only he was now several years younger. At first, I thought he was related, but when I squinted my eyes, I saw that he had the same tattoo. I'm still not sure how that was possible. They all seemed flawless, like they carried this ethereal glow to them. 
A pretty weird thought, but even though I was tied down, I still had eyes. It wasn't like a nice type of attractive though, but rather artificial, like that of a porcelain doll. Every feature was completely smooth, and they had a neutral yet sinister expression. Their face looked wrong somehow. It was as if something had combined the words most beautiful people and pasted them onto a mannequin. I felt the bed tilt forward to the point where I was straight up facing the glass window. I heard footsteps coming near me and I heard the movement of surgical tools. Don't panic, it'll only be a second. You're just going to feel a tiny pinch, whispered a husky voice. Please, don't, I begged. I tried to push against the restraints but couldn't even move a finger. I'm assuming you're probably trying to move. I can see it on the heart monitor. But don't worry, the nerve blocker will prevent you from hurting yourself. And once again, I passed out and woke up in a completely sterile room. I laid in another hospital bed surrounded by other beds, but I could only hear the beep of my ventilator. I looked around and saw a wrapped up body laying on the bed across the room. I got up slowly and my back started feeling like it was on fire, but I pushed through with every step. Once I reached the bed, I saw a clipboard on top of the table next to it. Subject, 1830. Status, deceased. Cause of death, aplastic anemia. Oh, Jack. I wanted to pull back the cover to see what he looked like. This man who had spent all his life locked away being harvested for some unknown reason. They didn't even have the decency to give him a name. Subject, 1830. I really wanted to pull the cover, I swear I did, but I just didn't have it in me. I started to hear voices coming from the door at the end of the room, and I quickly went back to my bed. I closed my eyes but moved head to face the door, and with a beep, the doors automatically opened. Sir, we have to finish the extraction for Subject 1830 and prepare the crematory. A woman's voice spoke. I could hear the clacking of the typing of a laptop. What a waste. It's a shame. He had the highest concentration of Ambermine, and he was the longest lasting as well. The others never fared as well as he did. How long did he last? His file says that he lasted over 18 years in this facility. The woman replied. He used to be obsessed with that beanstalk story. Let's hope the new one doesn't take long to acclimate to his environment. We can't have the mental stress affecting his health. Our superiors are overestimating the production of Ambermine. Those imbeciles keep signing contracts with superficial cosmetic companies and don't bother researching alternatives. I tried to look over to see but I was afraid to make a sudden move. So I merely opened my eyes a tiny squint looking over to see a red-headed overweight man standing next to a skinny short nurse. That must be Dr. Rigo, the same one Jack said was the head of extractions. I tried to keep my eyes closed and right as Dr. Rigo walked over to me, alarms started blaring throughout the building. Crap, we have to follow the emergency protocols. Dr. Rigo pulled out a syringe from behind his back and the nurse tried to rush forward but I panicked and I grabbed a panhandle and hit him in the face causing him to drop the syringe. He stumbled back and grabbed at his head while the nurse lunged forward to grab the syringe, but I shoved her before she could grab it and I jammed the syringe into the doctor's chest. The nurse went to the side and kept pushing a butt near the side of the bed, as if she was calling for more staff. But the alarms were too loud for anyone to hear anything, so I punched her in the head and I fell forward. My vision was turning dark and I could see the doors open and two men rushing in. I thought one of them looked familiar when I heard my name being called out. Nick, hey buddy, I'm right here, said one of the men. I wanted to say something back but my eyelids felt way too heavy for me to even see, much less speak. I woke up in the back of some sort of vehicle with a bunch of other men around me, seven to be exact. I was beyond freaked out, but when I reached over, I realized that I knew some of them from photos of Uncle Bernard and his army buddies. Hey, Sleeping Beauty is awake, replied the man sitting on my left. I think his name was Zane Mullins. 
His blonde hair and sad blue eyes made him stand out in the picture with my uncle. He was the only one I really recognized. I looked over at the passenger seat to see my Uncle Bernard leaning over to me. All right, kid? He asked, his voice carrying through the air like a soft thread. With those four simple words, I broke down sobbing like a little kid. I tried to open my mouth to say something, but I couldn't stop shaking, and I was gasping with every breath, just crying and crying. I didn't understand anything that had happened. I felt a hand to pat on my shoulder in an attempt to comfort me. Let it out, kid. You did fine. Bernard's voice said in a slight whisper. After a couple of hours, we finally arrived at a rundown motel in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't even sure what state we were in anymore, but I knew that we were nowhere near Kentucky. They gave me some actual clothes to change out of, the hospital gown, which was practically exposing all of me. The room itself was nothing special, but it was packed with diagrams, maps, and weapons laying all over the bed and the spare table. What is all this? I asked. This was us planning to get you out of that place. What was that place? We don't really know. My uncle asked while glancing over at Zane. So, what do you know? Zane moved an already open file that was on the table and shuffled some photos before passing it over to me. Unrecognizable black charred debris laid in a large pile. It was my house or whatever was left of it. Are my parents really dead? I asked, hoping to hear that maybe like me, they were safe in a motel somewhere. My uncle nodded sadly. I talked to one of the firemen that responded to the scene and said that he found the remains of both of your parents. The guy said they were both dead before the fire. Can't we go to the cops? No. The fireman and the other guy were both found dead a couple of days later. Zane spoke up. The only reason I heard about the fire was because some private investigator named Jason Kasakova reached out to me, pertaining information regarding your whereabouts. He had stumbled upon something strange, and when he didn't hear back from your parents, he put two and two together and somehow found me. What do you mean, something strange? I asked. All the men pulled up a chair and took a seat at the table, while my uncle motioned me to sit across from him. The P.I. worked as a former detective before he retired, somewhere in New York City. In one of his cases, a kid was taken in broad daylight. The neighbors reported that there were black vans and men in suits patrolling the neighborhood a couple of days before the disappearance. He obtained footage of the kid being taken and when he tried to bring it forward to his superiors, he was shut down and the footage was erased. The kid's family was later found dead due to carbon monoxide poisoning. He thinks something spooked his superiors so much that they covered it up. He paused before glancing over at Zane and then over at me. A week before the kid disappeared, he took a DNA test. He was also adopted. I felt a twinge of sadness and anger, but mostly guilt. Did I get my parents killed? Was I the cause of this? We don't want you to start blaming yourself. It's natural to feel curiosity about where you came from. Zane spoke up. I guess he could read the expression on my face. Yeah, it's not your fault. Another one of his friends whose name I haven't learned yet spoke up. My uncle gave a weak smile before looking back at the papers in front of us. So, where do I come in? I asked quietly. After the PI heard about the fire, he quickly combed over all these surveillance footage from nearby locations and found these. He pulled out a couple of photos and upon closer inspection, it was the same old man and woman in the sundress that was at the mass service and my extraction or harvesting, whatever it was. I looked over at my uncle, allowing him to continue. He gave them over to another guy that ran them through some fancy computer software, but he didn't just find their identities. A whole bunch. What do you mean? Like various different identities and aliases that span through different time periods. It doesn't make sense, but somehow they might be older than they look. We all thought it was maybe some weird resemblance or relation, 
But when we looked closer into their identities, we realized it was all fake. Nothing to them, just cardboard cutouts of what a person is supposed to be. Their current identities are Francine and Thomas Winton. On paper, they seem well-rounded. A bunch of fancy education and charities, but when we verified them, nothing came up. I know it didn't make sense to them, but I wanted to wait a bit before I told them my side of the story. Somehow, they just came to be and used their money to form a biotech startup. Zane shook his head before gulping down a glass of water. Nothing about it makes sense. I think I can add another piece to the puzzle. I started off before elaborating with the rest of my story. The men sat there in silence, just looking at the floor but listening to every word that I was saying. By the end, we sat there in silence, dwelling onto the overload of information we had all learned. If what he's saying is true, they're probably using that DNA stuff to drag down individuals with whatever that thing is and using it to rejuvenate themselves. My uncle stated, I don't understand any of it. The science doesn't make any sense here. Another one of the men spoke up. Regardless of the science, one thing is for sure. They have enough money and power to hunt us down eventually. We saw their facility. It was bad enough we lost a couple of men during our rescue mission, but that was nothing. The hard part is staying off the grid until we can figure out our next steps. They lost men? How many people have already died because of me? I simply wanted to take a freaking DNA test and explore my background. I spent the rest of the night thinking and thinking. My uncle and his friends are better off without me. Heck, my uncle was sober and I'm not sure if Zane and he are a thing, but I can't bear being responsible for their deaths as well. I could invent to them because they did so much for me and somehow I stumbled upon this forum. I just wanted to vent on here. I'm not sure what to do. I guess I just wanted someone to hear my story before we go off the grid. Maybe I should just hand myself over. My husband sneaks out every night when he thinks that I'm sleeping. Written by Sci-Fi Writer 3592 I met Alexander when I were to say bartender in college. My mother was an addict and her boyfriend was a creepy dude who spent all his time harassing me. I had filed a restraining order on both of them and so I threw myself in as much work in school as I could. I was in my last year when I was introduced to him by one of the other patrons who was trying to set us up and we just clicked. He was cute, funny, and handsome. He had these hazel eyes that turned into pure gold and the right lighting and his smile could charm even the most violent beast into being his friend. I was so overworked and stressed out that to me, life felt like a dark thunderstorm just waiting to drown me. But Alexander pulled me out of that darkness of my life. And pretty soon, he became my sun, my moon, and all my stars. He waited for me to graduate and in the meantime, he interned at some fancy accounting company while I worked on setting up a marketing business. Once I graduated and he had finished up his internship, we moved in together in an apartment and eventually he proposed. After a couple of years of moving around and advancing in our careers, we ended up in a small town in upstate New York. I was a little hesitant about moving to a small town, but after some convincing, I realized that our long-term financials were better off if we relocated to an area with a lower cost of living compared to staying in the city. The pandemic had exacerbated our time frame of moving out of the city and buying a house. Besides, when we had kids, they would have lots of room to play and explore. We found this beautiful house built near a large lake. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have chosen it because I hate the water, but Alexander was so insistent on it. He said that it was our forever home, our little slice of heaven. It was perfectly isolated away from any intrusive neighbors or drunk tourists. So I agreed. And we moved in on April 19th, 2020. The first half of the year went by great. We both worked virtually and I was ecstatic at how our relationship was going with the both of us being home 24-7. We would go fishing, boating, swimming, camping, 
and even painting every other day. It felt completely and utterly perfect. It wasn't until his 30th birthday when I noticed that things had turned a little strange. I baked him a cake and made a romantic dinner, but noticed that he seemed a little distant. I tried asking him if something was wrong, but I could see that he would downplay his emotions and he brushed it off. I played along expecting him to tell me when he was ready, but he never opened up. This went on for a week before he was acting normally again, so I didn't bring it up again. I chalked it up to him turning 30 years old because he always lamented getting old. And then sometime last month, I started getting really nauseous in the morning and everything started to smell awful to me. Even the scent of foods I once enjoyed had diverted my appetite. I took a pregnancy test and found out that I was indeed pregnant. I spent all morning prepping myself for the news that I would tell Alexander. Funnily enough, Alexander had also wondered if I was pregnant, and that very same afternoon, he came back home with a pregnancy test. Once I told him, he was more ecstatic than I had ever seen, and he was already browsing nursery items on the internet. Because Alexander often ran errands on the town or went on frequent business trips, I decided to install security systems all throughout the house. I didn't feel safe being all alone in an isolated house anymore, especially with growing a whole mini-me in my stomach. When he came back, I told him about it and he agreed with my reasoning, but I felt like he was slightly hesitant. I didn't pay much attention to it and I apologized and told him I should have consulted with him beforehand. And then one night, I woke up at around 3am with the sudden urge to go to the bathroom, and I quickly got up and ran that way. It wasn't until I came back when I realized that the bed was completely empty. I laid back down and closed my eyes, thinking maybe when I went to the bathroom he also went to the bathroom in the basement or something. So I laid in bed expecting him to arrive, but after half an hour, I started to feel this strange sensation that he wasn't coming. I shook it off and tossed and turned until I fell asleep. I did have a Zoom conference in the early morning that had to maintain my full concentration for some business deal. Morning came and went, and my presentation went perfect. We were discussing celebratory plans for the weekend when I remembered about the former night. Hey sweetie, when I went to the bathroom last night, I noticed you weren't in bed. Um, was this around 3 in the morning? He asked, not even looking at me from his phone. Yeah, it was, I replied. Oh, yeah, I heard a weird noise in the garage and I went to check it out. I think I left the garbage open and some raccoons got in. I would have taken his word for it, but there was something odd about the way he said it. Nonetheless, we moved on and enjoyed the rest of our night. A couple of nights later, I had to run to the bathroom again. It was like my bladder had shrunk, but I guess that's one of the perks of being a pregnant woman. This time, I noticed that once again, he was gone from our bedroom. I was already up, so I went throughout our house looking for him. I even checked the garage, but I couldn't find him. I decided to go back to bed and wait for him, but I fell asleep waiting. In the morning, I decided to ask about it. Hey, sweetie, where were you last night? I woke up to pee again and you weren't there. I even fell asleep waiting. I whined jokingly while grabbing his arm and playing with it. I, uh, went for a walk. He replied while pulling his hand back. You went for a walk in the middle of the night. My playfulness now turned to curiosity. Yeah, I just couldn't sleep. Lately work has been stressing me out and I'm worried for you. For me? Well, for our kid... I don't know what the future holds. What if something happens to us? He or she will be all alone. He said while looking down at the floor. My heart burst and I wanted to hug the life out of him and ease every stressful thing he was worried about. I promise nothing will happen to us. We'll be fine. And if anything does, he or she will be fine because we will have raised them right. Look, the future is unpredictable. And nothing will ever be certain, but all we can manage is the way we react to things. For now, just to focus on us and how we can make things transition better. 
I said, hoping to at least alleviate some of his worry. I mean, what do you say to those concerns? Even I had those same exact worries. Thank you. You always know what to say. I promise I won't do it again. He smiled and pulled me closer for a quick peck. Things went perfectly after our little conversation and in fact, every night before bed, we would sit and fantasize about the things we would do with our future kids over a cup of tea. I used to be an avid coffee drinker in the nighttime. Since caffeine had no effect on me, I would drink it and fall asleep. However, since my pregnancy, Alexander started to make me a nice cup of tea. I guess my body had just adjusted to the growth of my womb because I no longer had to pee in the night. In fact, I was so knocked out that I'm pretty sure I could sleep through a whole tornado. I thought that was the end of it until I had a doctor's appointment. The doctor was an impatient, stubborn, cold old man, and as much as I preferred a sympathetic female doctor, he was the closest one within miles. The checkup itself went fine. My little one was growing pretty fast. In fact, the doctor insisted that I was three months pregnant, but I didn't believe him. After all, I only found out last month due to symptoms and I was positive that he was wrong. I took the standard urine test and went home. The day after, however, I got a call from the doctor's office. Hi, Mrs. Rodriguez. I just wanted to confirm some information. You said you weren't on any current medications, is that correct? He asked flatly. Yeah, that's correct. I don't take anything other than some prenatal vitamins, I replied. Okay, because we found traces of DPH in your urine. He replied annoyed at my supposed deception. I don't even know what that is. I replied, completely confused. It's one of the main ingredients in Benadryl. I find that most women have trouble sleeping at night and resort to sleeping pills. However, Benadryl is not a sleeping pill. Studies show that they can cause birth defects. If you're having trouble sleeping, I think you should come into my office and we can go through the cause and find out what treatment works best for you. Will you like to make another appointment? He pushed his tone, sounding more and more annoyed with every word. I don't like your accusatory tone. No, thank you. I replied firmly and hung up. The nerve of that old man. Oh, I didn't care how far away other doctors were. There was no way I was going back to him. That night, I vented to Alexander who was making me another cup of tea when it hit me. Ever since he started making me tea... I found myself incredibly drowsy and would sleep through the entire night. I smiled over at him and found myself wondering if he was capable of actually drugging me. I chuckled a bit but out of curiosity, I declined his tea. I think I might stop drinking the tea at night, it makes me too drowsy. You can drink it though, I said while slightly moving the cup towards him. Are you sure? He asked while reluctantly grabbing the cup. Yeah, take it. I said going back to my phone. He took the cup and raised it to his lips. I felt slightly relieved when I saw him take a big sip. I almost felt like an idiot for even thinking that. This is Alexander, my big softy. Hey, I'm gonna go get a glass of water. I said, standing up and heading into the kitchen. Yeah, okay. He said, looking down at his magazine. I opened the kitchen door and started opening the top cabinet and getting a glass cup when I noticed. One of the tea bags in the counter had slightly tore, releasing its contents. I grabbed a paper towel and wiped it, carefully collecting the residue before opening the garbage can. As I held it open, I noticed a glimpse of something silver reflecting off the kitchen light. I reached down to grab it, while putting the paper towel into the can. It was a plastic wrapper. The kind that encloses a single, individual capsule for Benadryl. You know, the kind where you snap a piece of the small tablet and peel off the silver thing. None of this made any sense. Why would he be drugging me? I couldn't confront him about it just yet. I wanted to check something. I looked up to see a camera pointed towards the kitchen door into the backyard while facing the counter. I had to check something. Are you okay in there? He asked from the other room. Yeah, I just needed to clean up. I went back into the living room and sat down for a bit, 
turning on the TV and watching it for a little while. It was uncanny watching him act like everything was alright. The more I thought about it, what did I really know about this man? He knew about my family and my entire past. He's even seen my crazy family and their horrible antics. But he said that he was an orphan that had no family, and we were both introverts that barely had any friends. We only had co-workers that we talked to over Zoom. I knew all the lovey-dovey stuff I saw on a daily basis, but who was he really? Curiosity was now tugging at all my heartstrings, and I wanted to cry. Why would he sneak Benadryl into my tea at night? Could he be sneaking out again? I decided to go into our office under the excuse of me wanting to finish up some work, but instead, I decided to pull up all the security camera footage. The usual day stuff was fine, so I fast forwarded it right to before he made my tea. The footage showed Alexander walking into the kitchen and heading towards the top counter, getting a box of tea packets. He set the stove and put some water and sat down at the table and went on his phone. Once the water started boiling, he carefully poured some onto a cup and put the tea bag inside. He opened another cabinet and pulled out a small pink and blue box. Crap. He opened a plastic capsule and pulled one of them out and crushed it with a spoon before pouring it into the tea. That wouldn't make any sense. Wouldn't he be affected by it? Why would he be fine giving it to me? I decided to go to another day, fast forwarding it through the night. But we both slept soundly throughout the entire night. I sat there just watching the both of us lying in bed. Our breathing was unison. And I stuck my leg out of my side of my bed at least five times one hour. I sat there reflecting on my actions. Maybe there was an explanation that I was missing. Maybe he was doing it because he wanted me to sleep. I almost began to laugh at the absurdity of my situation. When I realized that I kept sticking my leg out at the exact angle, it seemed off. Every 10 minutes in that recording, I would shift and stick my leg out at an exact angle and turn back to the right side of the bed to face him. It was a freaking loop. I quickly backed out of the recording and moved on to a different date. The same exact thing with the tea. He would crush up a capsule of Benadryl and pour it into my tea. But the time frame between the hours of 3 and 5, the recording would be looped to make it look like we had slept all night long. I sat there thinking about what to do when it hit me. The company had the original versions uploaded in the cloud somewhere. These physical recordings were edited, but the copies automatically saved offline. I quickly logged onto the computer website and entered my username and password. I checked the exact dates of the edited versions and found the recordings. Every night between the hours of 3 to 5 a.m., he would get up and head out, and then he would come back and lay in bed, just staring at the ceiling until my alarm went off. It was unnerving seeing the man that I loved, just lying there unblinking and emotionless. I had to see where he was going, but I couldn't do it tonight. He already knew that I didn't drink the tea. I had to wait another day just to avoid arousing his suspicion. I had trouble falling asleep that night. He tried to be all cute and cuddly with me, but I played along and I felt the goosebumps on my arm. My skin felt like a thousand bugs crawled over it when he touched me. It was killing me to pretend this way. How could he play it so cool? But eventually, my eyes felt heavy and I dozed off. I awoke to a loud bump and a hoarse whisper. Zoe, Zoe, are you awake? Alexander shook my shoulder as he asked. He was checking to see if I was still asleep. I kept my eyes shut and kept my breath nice and steady. I felt the weight of his body shift from the bed and onto the creaky wooden floorboards. I heard the slight footsteps head off into the hallway. I lit in bed for a couple of minutes, contemplating as to if I could truly wait until tomorrow. I cradled my stomach in an attempt to comfort myself. I just had to know. I quietly got up and grabbed a sweater and headed out as well. I went through the back door instead of the front. I didn't want him to hear the front door system. I typed the password in quickly and moved as fast as I could. I couldn't let him get away. By the time I reached the front of the house, I noticed that he was heading down the road into the direction of the lake. I walked over and snuck to the edges of the road. 
hiding between the various bushes and trees in an attempt to conceal myself and stay away from his view just in case he turned around. By the time we had reached the shores of the lake, I was slightly winded, and my knees were sore at having to kneel behind a bush. The glow of the moonlight had cast a silver glow over the lake, and I could hear these soft cries of every animal and insect in the forest. The only one that seemed to be consistent was the cacophony of crickets and mosquitoes flying near my neck. I could see my husband stand near the water, taking a moment to stare at the water before pulling off his shirt. He started taking off all of his clothing, standing completely nude, his pale white skin emphasized by the moonlight. If he weren't my husband, I would have thought that he was a ghost. And then he started picking at his skin, pulling off sheets of some kind of white film. What the heck was it? He reached deeper into his skin and started pulling off even more, revealing a bright red color underneath it. He wasn't picking things off his skin. He was ripping his skin off. I felt a disgusting feeling all over my body, like when you stare at those creepy holes that bugs make. That repulsive feeling didn't even come close to what I was witnessing. Underneath his skin, he looked like those pictures of when you see anatomy textbooks all red and the muscle fibers stringing off of him. But once he stepped into the water, his red flash started turning a deep green, and his fingers started turning sharper and sharper, as if the bone protruding into these claw-like things. What the heck was this? I have to be dreaming. That thing came out of my husband. I have to go. I had to run. After a couple of minutes, I started to walk back and made a full sprint towards our house. I ran in, setting off the security alarm, but I didn't care. I didn't have time to care. The sound of the alarm was too loud for me to think rationally. I grabbed my wallet and my car keys and quickly went into my car. I turned on my headlights revealing Alexander's body right in front of me, but it was all wrong. Ripples of fleshy skin hung off some areas exposing red muscles while others had green reptilian skin. Honey, is everything okay? That thing's voice no longer even sounding human, rather like a raspy mix of a husky barking and a reptilian lisp. I backed up until I almost hit the garage door in our driveway, and then I moved the steering wheel to the right as I moved the gear to drive, and pushed on the gas and as I passed that thing, it jumped on the side of my car. Zoe... Let's talk about this. It hissed. I slammed on the gas and it banged in the window, cracking it slightly. As I made it out into the road, I saw headlights up ahead. A truck was heading down my street and it was beeping at me once it saw that I was in its lane. I quickly swerved, trying to get the truck to slam onto the beast that was grabbing onto my car. But instead, my car flipped. And I felt instant pain everywhere as the car slammed against the road. The windows erupted into hundreds of little shards raining all over me. The last thing I saw before I fell into a deep sleep was an old trucker running to my side asking if I was okay. I looked over at the right passenger window, only to see the silhouettes of a dark figure taking off into the forest. I woke up in the hospital surrounded by cops and doctors, barraging me with a ton of questions, but I didn't have any answers to give them. Ma'am, where's your husband? Are you alone? What happened on the night of the incident? I tried to speak, but every time I opened my mouth, I felt the absurdity of my situation take over. If I told them anything, they would definitely lock me up in a mental ward. The doctors tried to comfort me by telling me that my baby seemed perfectly healthy. I would cradle my stomach, feeling for any signs of kicking. What once brought me joy now brought me curiosity and disgust. If Alexander was that thing, then what the heck was developing in my womb? In a couple of hours, I will be released from the hospital, and I'd try to do some research on my cracked up phone, but all I could get was something called a selkie, shape-shifting seductive creatures that stemmed from Celtic mythology, but were also found in Inuit mythology. The only difference is that Alexander was not a freaking seal. He seemed something straight out of hell. And that's not even the crazy part. From what I overheard from the nurses gossiping, 
Local cops found hundreds of human remains from this area spanning down to the lake. They think it could be the work of uh, several serial killers due to the timelines, but I think that I have a different theory. I'm not sure who to tell though. Anyone have any idea of what it is? I have nowhere else to go except home and I know for a fact that he will be there. I don't know what to do. Don't look out your window when the storm starts. They might see you. Written by Stories by Emily I remember it being the last day of school before summer break. When things started to go downhill for the residents of my town. I was sitting in class, taking my third period of final exam, when the rain started to pour heavily. I looked out the window, watching as these small drops of rain smear onto the glass window. I was already done with my test, waiting for everybody else in the class to finish. As a lady on the intercom came on to say, Attention, students and staff. We are currently having a terrible storm on this summer afternoon, and we advise you to be safe when returning back to your homes. If you don't have a ride, remember to contact your parents to remind them that school is letting out early due to the exam periods. Thank you all and have an awesome summer. I stayed in my seat and played on my phone until the bell rang. I was about to be an up-and-coming junior in my school, which meant I would be considered an upperclassman within just a couple of months. When the bell rang, my next class was chemistry. Afterwards, when the class period was finished, we could return home or stay at school. But we all knew the teachers just wanted us gone after that, so they wouldn't have to deal with us anymore for a few months. Halfway through my exam, the same lady came out of the intercom again to explain. Hello students and teachers. We are going to be extending this class period for a little bit longer today. Due to weather concerns, we will be staying in each classroom until the rain clears off. Don't worry, this will not affect the rest of your schedule for the rest of the day. I hope everybody has a good summer. I thought to myself, this is great. I had previously made plans with my friends to hang out after school, and I had to be home at my certain time. I prayed that it wouldn't interfere too much, and hoped that this didn't plan on lasting forever. When everybody was finished with their test, my teacher decided to put a movie on to pass the time. We ended up watching Inside Out, which was my favorite Pixar movie. After a while, I could tell everybody was starting to get concerned. The rain and thunder were not easing up, and I wanted to get home. One kid went over to the window, watching the rain as it hit the ground harshly, and some others gathered around the back of the classroom by the lab desk to chat. I stayed in my seat. I'm a shy kid who most usually ignore. You might say that I'm kind of a loner. While everybody else was doing their own thing, I decided to lay my head on my desk and rest my eyes for a second. That was what most kids sitting at the normal desk were doing anyways. I wasn't out for long. I checked my phone beforehand. It read, 10.41 a.m. The movie played. 
some of the kids talked, and my teacher was sitting at her desk doing nothing. It all seemed normal, doesn't it? When I woke back up, it was almost 12 p.m., and the classroom was completely empty. All the lights were cut off, and the projector screen from my teacher's computer was still on. I looked around. The rain had stopped outside, but where was everybody? I had a good friend in the class, Jeremy. I called his phone, but he didn't answer. I then proceeded to call my parents, but both went straight to voicemail. I wondered, was school finally let out? But why did nobody bother to wake me up? Don't worry, somebody will get their payback next school year. I opened the classroom door. The lights from the hallway were shut off, and there was barely any light coming from these small windows that shined into that hallway. I took out my phone and turned on my flashlight for a light. I checked some of the classrooms. Nobody was there. I yelled out into the hallway, but still, I didn't get a response. I roamed down one of the hallways where the fine arts classes are. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw. So many of the windows and doors were destroyed, as if a big group of people had stormed out of school and finding any way they could and turning it into an escape route. I suddenly heard a voice. It was faint but still detectable. It was back in the art room. A girl was standing in the windowsill, staring out into the parking lot. I knew who she was. Her name was Grace. She was quiet and sweet. That's what I liked about her. She was sort of an outcast like me. Neither of us really found our cliques at this place. Hey, Grace, is that you? It's me, Parker. What happened to everybody? It's like everybody just disappeared. She didn't respond for a couple of seconds, but turned around, got off the windowsill, and turned back around to face me. They are all gone, she states. It was like everybody in the room started to float, and they flew up into the sky. I didn't know what Grace was talking about, nor was I going to fall for this joke that she was saying. Grace starts walking closer towards me. We have to leave. Everybody's gone. They, they will come and get us next if we don't get the heck out of here. Grace starts to push on me. I could tell that she wanted to move, but I didn't. Look, Parker, I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is, I will not be a part of it. I saw these things outside. They were surrounding the school. I wasn't sure what exactly they were, but I need to show you. The thing about Grace was she never begged to do anything with somebody unless it involved setting them up for something dangerous. There was once a time when she found a way to manipulate a girl named Arya, who had recently moved into our town. Arya and Grace spent a lot of time together, and one day, Grace tried to get Arya to go down to a popular lake just a few miles away from our school. But the thing was, Arya wasn't a very good swimmer and ended up almost drowning while just trying to impress her cool new friend. After that, Arya wasn't seen much and rumors about Grace potentially trying to kill her shot up around the school. 
I told her I was staying inside until I knew what was happening. She was upset and ran out of the art room without saying another word to me. I followed her to see where she was going. She ran to the end of the hallway and vigorously opened the outside doors to the opening hallway. I could hear her start to yell. I'm free. I'm free. Take me home. Take me from this hell we call Earth. Suddenly, this supernatural, star-telling, and horrifying-looking creature merged from above and captured Grace. From a distance, I was able to get a good look at it. Its eyes, they were huge and blue. It had extremely small lips, but when it opened its mouth, it appeared to have a strangely crocked smile. Small ears, no nose, and a dismorphed body that is too much to explain. This thing didn't see me, but I feared that it would come for me next. It took grace and flew off. I was confused and I even pinched myself a couple of times. There were so many questions venturing through my head. Was Grace behind all of this? Was the reason this horrible storm came because of her? And more importantly, what was that thing flying in the sky that had captured her? I, I kept my distance in that moment. I was afraid of what that thing could do to me. I walked around the rest of that school, but yet again... I couldn't find a single person. That was until I had to make the brave decision to escape. At this point, it was almost 5pm, and nobody, my friends or parents had reached out. I was starving, and I needed to get home. So I walked outside. It was still raining, but it felt as if my fear had been numbed and I hurried out to my car. But I was quickly stopped by a strangely ungodly, inhuman scream. I should have just kept running to my car, but I didn't. Instead, I turned around, coming face to face with the same creature that had taken Grace. It stared at me, but didn't touch me. It was probably at least six feet from me, but it didn't come any closer. This thing had hands like humans, and reached out from its behind and took out a piece of paper. It looked like a note. There was writing, at least, and the creature placed the paper on the concrete, and then it walked away. As it turned around, it made another sterling noise just like the one it made a couple minutes ago. I watched it, but when it wasn't in my distance anymore, I unlocked my car and I slammed the door shut. I threw my belongings into the back seat, and I sat, looked out my windows, trying to come to terms with what just happened. I forgot to mention I also picked up the note when the thing had walked away. I pulled it out and I decided to read it. But what I found out, I could never come to terms with. Greetings, human. I want to say congratulations. You have survived the first round of our taking process. I know you have seen us. And I know what you might be thinking. We are not harmful creatures, but we prefer to be called the captors. It's very much to explain, but we are not here to cause issues with the humankind. There are things of this world you may not understand. 
Yet, I cannot explain right now to you what I am. But allow me to say that I will be back in the near future. I cannot tell you when, but it will be in your lifetime. I know your name is Parker Davidson. You live at 3462 Elm Street with your parents and a dog named Harley. You are not one to talk, and that is why you have been chosen to be free in this process. But I must give you a warning though. Next time you see heavy rain, just like what has happened today, don't be alarmed. If you hear these screams from a distance, don't be afraid. You are being protected in this process. The only rule is, you cannot explain or tell anybody about what you have seen today. This is your warning. I discovered the truth about heaven and hell in rural British Columbia. Written by Dan Ark. I live in a small town. If the word town is even appropriate, off of Highway 97 in British Columbia, a bit south of Prince George. The mines are closed and have been for decades. The lumber mill burned down over seven years ago and never reopened. Hard gravel and dirt roads cut through the forest and connect the few cabins that are still homes. Last night was looking to be just like the previous night, and the night before that. Cold, dark, and silent, except for the sound of the wind through the trees. I was getting ready for bed and cleaning up from dinner when I heard a soft knocking at my door. Soft enough that I thought that at first I had imagined it. I opened the door and there stood my nearest neighbor, Paxton, caught in the yellow glow of my single porch light. His white stubble was longer than usual and it looked like he had somehow lost considerable weight in the three weeks since I had last spoken with him. Paxton, never having been close to Chubby, was now an alarming sight. Paxton, is everything alright? I asked as I peered around. I didn't see any sign of his old Ford. Hey, neighbor. Paxton started. His pale eyes shook a little as he hesitated. I need your help. Of course. What's the problem? I asked, trying to sound encouraging, trying to overcome the unease growing in my gut. I need to get my... Paxton shivered. My things, yes but it is cold and slick on the way. I had no idea what he was talking about, but didn't have a chance to ask. Well, my vehicle is stuck. He shouted the final word and started coughing, but kept his hands at his sides. Once the coughing had subsided, he simply gazed past me. You hiked here in the dark from your house. I asked, equally confused and concerned. His house was at least a 20 minute drive through dense forest. Paxton didn't seem to hear my question. Yeah, that's right. The old machine is buried in the snow and rocks. If I was stronger, can you come with me? Help me, please, he asked. His eyes still not really focusing on me properly. I was perplexed. We hadn't seen any significant snowfall in almost a month. I noticed Paxton smelled weird, but not a bourbon. How about I give you a ride home and I come up tomorrow morning to see what can be done? When we have some light, I asked, hoping to sound reasonable. Paxton didn't blink. Maybe I can warm you up with some coffee before we head back out, I added. What were these signs of a stroke? And what about his wife, Jessica? What was she thinking right now? Oh, we can't drive. We can walk. The night is nice. Paxton looked at me and twitched. I'm sorry, Pax. I began slowly, but I'm exhausted. I was hoping to get a good night's sleep tonight. 
After a brief pause, Paxton broke out in the widest smile I'd ever seen on his face. I'm so sorry, neighbor. He burst out laughing. The laughter turned into another series of coughs. He smacked himself in the chest. I will go, he abruptly announced and then turned away. I started after him but stopped when I noticed the back of his jacket. Down fluttered from the edges of large tears. The back of his jeans appeared dark as if stained. I watched as Paxton and disappeared into the night. I closed the door, locked it, and went to the phone. I picked up the phone and dialed his home hoping to speak with Jessica. But the phone rang and rang and no one picked up. Something was clearly wrong. I looked around my living room for nothing in particular, trying to come up with an idea, or maybe more of an answer than an idea. The only answer I received was the slow crackling of my dying fire. I picked up the phone again, but this time dialed Roger who lived much closer to Paxton. After a few rings, the phone was picked up. <sighs> a tired voice answered, Roger, this is Dan. Dan? Roger asked, still half asleep. Dan, what the heck? He demanded. God dang it. He grumbled as something was knocked over. Roger, I'm sorry to be calling late and waking you up, but have you seen Paxton today? I asked, hoping to pull Roger's attention back from whatever the heck was going on on his end. Actually, Paxton was by tonight. I think he was drunk. Roger said from a distance. Something made a loud smack near the phone. There, Roger noted and continued. Yeah, he was acting as if he was 45 years younger and were in the city. I would have said that he was on drugs. I know what you mean. He was just here, here at my place a few minutes ago. I thought maybe he needed to go to the hospital. He wasn't making any sense. And it looked like... I tried to think about how to describe what I had seen. Looked like what? Roger asked. It looked like he had been attacked or something. I tried to explain. His back was all torn up. Roger was silent. And when he left, just a few minutes ago, I tried calling Jessica, but no one would pick up. I'll get dressed and go on over, Roger stated, and see what is happening. Thank you. I replied relieved. I'll get in my truck and meet you there. Okay, Roger confirmed and hung up. I put down the phone and grabbed my jacket and keys and I rushed through the front door and locked it. I wrestled with the idea of bringing my revolver for a moment but I decided I was overreacting. I ran to my Toyota and started it. As I rolled down my driveway, I wondered if I was going to pass Paxton on the way to his house. The drive through the forest was oddly uneventful. I never did see Paxton on the road. I eventually turned onto Paxton's driveway and zigzagged my way up to his cabin. Roger's newer Toyota was already parked, and the front door to the cabin was wide open. There was no sign of anyone. I parked alongside Roger's truck and got out. I noticed that there was no snow on the ground and no sign of Paxton's old Ford. I opened my door and paused for a moment, listening. There was just silence. Even the wind had died for the moment. I got to the front door of the cabin and I peeked inside. The lights were on and nothing looked out of place. I walked in slowly into the center of the large living room. Even with the fireplace dark, the room still felt cozy. I thought I heard something below. Paxton's cabin was quite large with both an upper and lower level. Hey, it's Dan. I announced as I went to these stairs that would take me down. The sound became clearer as I descended the stairs. At the bottom was an open door leading to a poorly lit room. The sound of someone sobbing spilled out in bursts. I cautiously entered the room and looked around. The wall opposite me was lined in shelves while the area to my right was a mass of wooden drawers and cabinets. The left wall was divided by a wide doorway which opened to another room. Flopped on the floor at the opening was Roger, with his head pressed into the floorboards, 
Roger was a not a small man and he filled the doorway. I crouched down and put my hands on his shoulders. After a moment, he looked up at me, his leathery face wet and blotchy. He opened his mouth to say something, but there was only silence as tears dripped free from his gray beard. After a moment, he just closed his mouth and shook his head. My stomach tightened and a cold sweat flashed along my back. I looked past Roger into the room which was full of tools and tables. On the ground, a bit past Roger, a single small shoe was sitting on its side. Behind the shoe, a motionless leg lay partially obscured by a workbench. I stood up and moved to go past Roger. He made a wet sound and grabbed me, but I brushed his hands away as I stepped over him. I grew cold as I approached the leg. I walked around the workbench and looked down at Jessica. She was clearly dead. Her torso was oddly twisted and misshapen. Her head was a mess and I couldn't find her face. Her fists were splattered with red, but there was strangely little of it on the ground. From the movies, I would have expected Jessica to be soaking in a lake of it. I violently sucked in some air and backed away toward Roger. I was suddenly shaken by the knocking of overhead steps. I stumbled and latched onto a nearby table for support. I stared upwards as these steps came to a halt. I looked over and Roger was dragging himself up off the floor. The hard footsteps resumed. I began looking over the room, searching for potential weapons. I spotted a claw hammer and took it off the wall and played with it in my hands. It felt good and heavy. I started searching for a weapon for Roger, but when I looked over, he was gone. Roger, I hissed. What the heck? The footsteps above seemed to be moving toward the staircase which led to the bottom floor. I quickly snatched the nearest tool, a mallet, and ran out and through the storage room. I caught Roger climbing the staircase already halfway to the top. Maybe he didn't need a weapon. He was at least three times the size of Paxton, but after seeing Jessica, I didn't feel confident in anything. Roger! I shouted as quietly as possible. Roger ignored me and continued climbing. After a moment of hesitation, I jumped to the first step and followed after him. I heard talking as I approached the living room. I surmounted the final step but could go no further. Roger had his back to me and blacked out most of the living room. I pushed past his right side, eager but not ready to confront Paxton. But instead, I found a dark-haired woman with a canvas duffel bag slung over her shoulder and some kind of gun holstered on her right hip. Roger was still wiping at his face. He moved to give me some space and the woman took a step back to accommodate the growing circle. Dan, this is Sam. Roger explained. I called her just before I left. I thought it might be better if she... He trailed off. Hi, I said and fumbled with the hammer and mallet. I put my hand out. Hey. She returned as she quickly shook my hand. There was a moment of quiet confusion as I looked to Roger, to Sam, and then down to Sam's gun. Look, she began. You two wait here and I'll be back in a minute. She stated as she moved to the staircase. Roger and I both started to object as she descended. If the guy comes back, just shout for me, okay? She ordered as she disappeared. I looked at Roger and he looked at me. Well, who the heck is she? I asked, and where did you come from? I don't know her very well, Roger confessed. I just know she started renting the vacation cabin near me about two months ago. He continued. We've talked a couple of times. He added and snapped. She does a lot of hiking and running. Um, okay. I said and gave Roger a questioning look. I just thought, he exhaled. Jessica might have an easier time talking to another woman. Fresh tears started to form in the corner of his eyes. He collapsed on the couch near the fireplace and resumed wiping his face and nose. I walked over and sat down beside him. I gave him a minute to collect himself. 
Here, I offered and held out the mallet. He looked at the mallet and a hint of a smile formed. What am I supposed to do with this? He asked as he took it from me. It looked like a toy in his meaty hands. He studied it for a moment and gave the wooden coffee table a dull smack with the rubber head. He looked at me and we laughed weakly. I don't know, I admitted. You were gone and I thought we needed weapons, so I just grabbed something. Roger nodded like he understood. The sharp report of Sam's boots sounded up these stairs and we looked up. She came over to us and gave us a sorry look but didn't look especially affected by what was downstairs. After a moment, she dropped her duffel bag at her feet and began rummaging around for something. I didn't know it at the time, but while we were gathered in the living room and Sam was looking in her bag, Paxton was emerging from the woods near our local gas station. The kind of gas station with an unfamiliar name and logo to everyone else on the planet. And honestly, the only reason that most people ever stop in our area. Luckily, I was later able to collect the security camera footage and hide the bodies before anyone else stumbled onto the scene. At approximately 11.54pm, Jason Martin and his wife Ashley pulled off of Highway 97 heading northbound in a U-Haul truck. Ashley appeared asleep in the passenger seat when they pulled up to one of the two pumps. Jason exited the truck and went inside the station. Inside, Jason met the night manager Judy, a gentle woman in her late 50s with wavy gray hair and a severe nicotine habit. She had moved to our area after some sort of personal tragedy and mostly kept to herself. Jason asked Judy if he could use the washroom. The station's washroom had been out of order long enough for it to be converted into a storage room. There is an outhouse beyond the station. Jason paid for his gas, some snacks, and walked around to the outhouse. It's unclear exactly what happened next due to the limited camera footage, but I found Jason's body a short distance past the outhouse at the edge of the forest. His head had been partially pulled free. His jaw and the surrounding flesh had been completely torn away. Eventually, I spotted his jaw overhead, tangled in the upper branches of a nearby tree. Paxton came into view, his front looking dark and wet. He walked swiftly to the parched U-Haul, ignoring the station completely. Ashley still appeared asleep. He circled the truck twice before stopping next to the passenger door. He opened the door and immediately tried to drag Ashley from her seat. Ashley woke and started fighting back after a moment of confusion. Paxton grabbed hold of her right arm and started pulling, but her seatbelt was evidently secured, and it was resisting Paxton. The pulling became more and more frantic and the seatbelt retained its firm grasp on Ashley. Finally, Paxton yanked and twisted away from the U-Haul. Ashley's body could no longer endure the attack. Her arm came apart at the shoulder. Red splashed out of the passenger side of the truck, and Paxton continued away from the vehicle for a few steps, clutching the severed arm as if he thought he had been successful in dragging Ashley from the vehicle. There was no audio on the security footage, but Judy must have heard screaming because she abruptly rushed outside, just as Paxton had started tugging on Ashley's arm. Judy came upon the U-Haul just in time to witness Paxton ripping Ashley's arm free. Paxton had his back to Judy and was distracted by the arm in his hands. The scene must have been traumatic, because Judy slowly sank down to the asphalt and then fainted a few seconds later. Paxton realized he was holding only part of Ashley and dropped the arm like trash. He noticed Judy not long after. He evaluated her for a moment and then stepped over her and entered the station. He found some cheap, fluorescent camping rope and returned. Paxton bent down and cruelly bound Judy's legs and arms. He then lifted her with little effort and flopped her over his shoulder. Without hesitation, he briskly walked back toward the forest in the same direction he had come, leaving the dead or perhaps a still dying Ashley alone in the U-Haul. Back in Paxton's living room, Sam continued to dig around in her bag as Roger and I watched from the couch. I didn't know what Sam was doing, but it was obvious that we needed to call the police. I got up and started looking around. I found a beige phone on the wall in the kitchen and picked it up. 
Sam came out of nowhere and snatched it out of my hand and yanked the cord out and tossed the receiver. It broke into pieces by the stove. I was stunned. What the heck? I demanded as Sam walked back to her bag. We need to call the cops, I stressed. Ha, Sam barked. The RCMP can't do anything for us. She pulled something metallic from the side pocket of her bag as I continued to protest. We don't have time for a meeting at the town hall. Sam interrupted sarcastically. Take this. She requested of Roger and dropped something into his hand. She studied Roger for a moment and then came over to me and held her hand out, palm up. Resting in her hand was a large, silvery disc, which looked like some kind of oversized ancient coin. I picked it up. It was cold and heavier than it looked. I couldn't read the circle of engravings. Apparently satisfied, Sam turned from me and took a seat in front of the fireplace. I slipped the disc into my pants pocket. Okay, I need both of you to tell me exactly what happened earlier tonight, Sam instructed. Leave nothing out. No, I argued. I don't know who you are, but there's a dead person downstairs and a murderer out there somewhere. We need to get help. Sam sighed and pulled a leather wallet from her inner jacket pocket and tossed it to me. I caught it and opened it. Inside on one flap was a silver badge and on the opposite flap was an official looking card. It identified her as Captain Samantha LaCroix as a Special Incidents Investigative Officer of Joint Task Force 2. I silently returned the wallet to Sam and took a seat beside Roger. Satisfied? asked Sam. Good, now tell me what happened. Over the following five or ten minutes, Roger and I both went over our bizarre encounters with Paxton. Afterwards, Sam sat in silence mulling over our testimonies. You're both very lucky, she concluded. The husband is infected, she tried to explain. He is no longer himself. Have either of you heard of that ant, zombie fungus? It sounded familiar, but apparently it was a rhetorical question. It's this creepy fungus that gets into ants, she continued. It takes over their brains and sprouts out of their heads and forces them to act like idiots to help us spread the fungus. This is like that. Roger and I looked at each other. Sam continued. I know one of the old mines around here is the source of the infection. I just don't know which one. Roger thought for a moment. Paxton talked to you about snow, he asked me. Yeah, said that his truck was buried. There are only about two mines that could have snow right now. One of them is about two hours away. The other one, he said, and pointed easterly. is about a 45 minute drive east from here up to an old logging road. That sounds promising, Sam said. Except, Roger continued, the road doesn't get you the entire way. You have to hike for about three kilometers to the mine once the road ends. Amazing, thank you, both of you, Sam said. She sounded genuine. Help me find this mine on my map and then the two of you should get out of here. Maybe stay together until tomorrow to be safe. What are you going to do? I asked. I'm going to end this so no one else gets hurt. Tonight. Sam stated plainly, like this was just another day for her. I'm coming with you, Roger asserted. I'm sorry, but no. Sam shook her head. This is dangerous and I can't do my job and look after you at the same time. I've known Paxton a long time. He deserves better and he needs my help. Roger insisted. Sam clenched her jaw. There is no cure or treatment, she stated, getting angrier with each word. Or anything that can help. There's nothing you can do. The two glared at each other and then spent the next few minutes arguing. And finally, Sam relented. Fine, you can come. Sam compromised. But only if Dan comes too. Uh, what? I asked. The chances of Roger not getting killed are better if the two of you stick together. Sam explained. Now, can we please get going? I'll be right back. Roger said and marched through the kitchen. He wasn't gone long, but when he returned, he was holding a bolt-action rifle in one hand and a large hunting knife in the other. We headed outside. 
Beyond the lights of the cabin, the forest was pitch black. There was no hint of the moon or any stars, and the sky was smothered. Except for gusts of wind and the creaking and scratching of the trees, the night was otherwise silent. We loaded our gear into Roger's truck and got in. The truck was better equipped for the logging route than Sam's black sedan. Roger started his truck and the headlights illuminated the driveway. We pulled away from the cabin, leaving Jessica behind like a bad memory. We cut our way through the dark like a solitary torch. In the back seat, my mind drifted as we drove. I was Paxton just wandering around in the woods with this fungus stuff growing inside of his head. I watched these shadows dance past. My leg felt cold and I reached down. I touched something hard and remembered the strange disc Sam had handed me. I stared at the back of her head. I didn't trust her. Hey, Sam, I asked. Hmm. She replied without looking back. Why did you give us those discs? Sam was silent for a second. They are an effective way of testing for infection in the field, she replied. They cause blistering when in contact with someone infected. I wasn't a scientist, but that didn't make any sense to me. There's something on the road, Roger announced. Sam sat a little straighter. I leaned forward between the gap of the front two seats. Up ahead on the road, two small lights blinked out from the shadows. We slowed down. Our lights revealed a single doe standing in the gravel road. She looked at our vehicle for a moment and then sauntered back into the trees. Roger let out a nervous laugh and we relaxed. He took his foot off the brake and we resumed our journey. Not long after, we turned onto the logging road for the mine. The road was bumpy and the trees along the road were overgrown. Thin branches slapped the glass and metal as we made our way upward. A sparse coating of snow was started to appear on the ground. We could see the tire tracks of a previous vehicle as the snow deepened. We followed the tracks all the way up until the end of the road. We parked just before a pair of posted signs. They had to be at least 40 years old, but they were still quite readable in our lights. Do not enter. Serious injury or death beyond this point. No trespassing. Falling rocks. We got out of the truck. I found the snow to be only a few inches deep. We collected our things. I slipped the claw hammer through a loop of my pants at my side. Roger slung the rifle over his shoulder and put the hunting knife on his belt. Sam handed out spare flashlights from her bag. We approached the posted signs. The tire tracks that we followed up the road ran between the two upright signs. Scattered between the signs and across the tire tracks were the wooden remains of a third sign. The tracks disappeared into the darkness ahead of us. Sam turned to us. This is literally life and death, she said. Do what I say. She continued and looked to me. Without question, and we might all survive this. She adjusted her bag on her shoulder and started hiking forward. Roger and I followed with our flashlights aimed at the ground before us. As we hiked, the trees started thinning and the terrain on our left ascended. At the same time, everything on our right gradually dropped away. For the time being, our path was still comfortably wide. Strangely, the tire tracks continued on with no sign of the vehicle that had created them. Suddenly, Sam stopped. I looked around, anticipating danger. She walked over to where the ground had started to drop away and crouched down. I cautiously approached Sam, but Roger stayed where he was. With a bit of moonlight, the view would have likely been amazing. I thought that I could see Paxton's cabin. It was hard to make out the distance a speck of light. But Sam wasn't interested in the view. She was focused on a set of fresh tracks in the snow which seemed to originate from the steep slope below. She followed the tracks with her flashlight. They moved away from the soft edge and turned toward the direction of the mine. I moved a few paces back from the edge and studied the tracks. They were irregular. It looked like something was being partially dragged. At first, I thought some kind of animal must have left the tracks, but maybe it was a mountain lion with a fresh kill. But the occasional, well-defined human shoe print was impossible to ignore. 
I wanted to dismiss what I was seeing. Nobody was scrambling up the mountainside in the middle of the night. Paxton was too old and too far away, wasn't he? Sam came over and gave me a hard look. Can you shoot? I nodded. Yeah, I own a pistol. Sam dropped her bag and fished out a semi-automatic pistol. It was smaller and more conventional looking than the one she wore on her hip. She handed me the gun and two additional magazines. It's loaded, and there's one in the chamber, she warned. I pocketed the magazines, and I couldn't fit the gun in any of my pockets, so I tucked it under my belt at my back. The metal was instantly freezing against my skin. We walked over to Roger. What is it? He asked. There are tracks, probably Paxton, Sam explained. He might have someone with him. One of your neighbors, I, I don't know. Ah, heck, Roger grumbled. Listen, both of you, she continued. If I say shoot, you start shooting, and you don't stop. I'm serious. Roger and I both reluctantly nodded. Center mass, body shots, that will only slow them. You need one or two clean headshots to put them down, she finished. Come on, time is against us. Sam shouldered her bag and resumed hiking toward the mine. I wasn't eager to enter the mine, and I just didn't want to be left alone. So Roger and I quickly followed after Sam. The three of us continued hiking upward, following both the tire tracks and the other more recent, irregular footprints. The path narrowed, and the surrounding terrain became more severe. Eventually, we were flanked by two bare cliffs, one high above us on our left and a sudden drop on our right. At this height, with little surrounding cover, the wind was piercing. I wished that I had brought some gloves. Gradually, the path became more difficult underfoot. Small stones, echoes of the old rock slide. They were becoming more and more frequent under the snow. It wasn't long until we came upon the bulk of the slide that had never been cleared. With the snow, it looked like a soft white hill. In reality, it was a treacherous pile of slippery large boulders, loose footing, and hitting gaps waiting to snap ankles. But at least we finally had an answer to the mysterious tire tracks. Paxton's old Ford was wrapped around a series of boulders at a bizarre angle. I wouldn't have said that it was buried, but it was definitely lodged in the side of the slide. I can't imagine how fast he must have been driving at the moment of impact. There was no way around the slide. We were going to have to climb over it. The other tracks indicated that Paxton had recently done the same. May, Roger called out. He had his flashlight aimed at something near the start of the route that Paxton had taken over the slide. And we came over and looked at what Roger had found. Paxton quit smoking, he said as he held up a pack of cigarettes. The pack didn't look like it had been sitting out for long. There were still two untouched cigarettes inside. Crap. That supports the idea that he has another body with him now, Sam said. So there are two infected then, asked Roger. At least. Anyone we find inside will be infected, Sam answered. Okay, but we're going into the mine, I asked. Obviously, she replied. She didn't catch what I was trying to imply. Yes, but if we're going into the mine, aren't we also going to get infected by the fungus? I asked. Right, she said and paused. Um, the way it works is you need to be in close proximity with the, the source of the infection for a prolonged period of time, for around at least 30 minutes, and we'll be fine. Sam looked at her watch. How far is the mine after the slide? She asked Roger. Not very. A few minutes, I think. Okay, let's get going, she said and started climbing with both hands and feet. The business of getting over the slide was a slow and awkward one. More than once I nearly lost my balance, but in the end, all three of us made it over safely. I wasn't looking forward to the return trip. We could see the mine's entrance from where we stood. It looked like a rocky blister swollen from the side of the cliff. In the approximate center was a rough black hole. The tracks ahead of us led directly to the mine. We followed them silently for a minute or so until we reached the cankerous mouth. There were no signs or plaques identifying the mine, just rock and old timber. 
I was surprised that there was nothing official about the lives lost during the cave-in and rock slide. We stood outside the entrance for a few minutes while Sam silently leaned against a support beam with her eyes closed. It almost looked like she was praying or meditating. Besides the tracks entering the mine, there is no sign of any recent activity. There are no sounds or lights or anything coming from within. I remember that moment clearly even now. Standing there, staring into that dark hole, looking for my courage. Trying to fool myself into thinking that I was ready for whatever was about to happen. Now though, I just wished that I had walked away. If I had the chance to do it all again, I would have sent ten people in my place and continued living my normal life. Alright, guns out. Sam ordered and pushed away from the frozen dark wood. We complied. Roger pulled the rifle from his shoulder and inspected it in a familiar manner. I grabbed the pistol from my back. Somewhere in the forest below us, an owl screeched. I jumped and dropped the gun. Sorry. I apologized to no one in particular and fished it out of the snow at my feet. Sam freed the pistol that had been on her hip this entire time. She looked it over with her small flashlight held on her lips. The pistol was large and silver with dark engravings which reminded me of the disc in my pocket. I couldn't tell if the gun was ornate or ultra-modern, or if it belonged in a museum. We ventured past the threshold with Sam again leading the way. Sam and I provided the light. Roger couldn't hold a flashlight in his rifle at the same time. The main tunnel was immediately tight. Roger and I could barely walk side by side without rubbing up against the rough stone walls. Roger had about a foot of space between the ceiling and the top of his head. We moved through the tunnel at a slow but steady pace. My flashlight caught our white breath no matter how I angled it. After a few minutes, I lost sight of the entrance. Deep black darkness surrounded us. We pushed against these shadows with our lights and moved deeper into the earth. Eventually, we came into a fork in the tunnel. We paused for a moment while Sam considered the two choices. Our situation reminded me of a scene from The Lord of the Rings and I smiled. I tried smelling the air, but my nose was too cold. This way, Sam whispered and headed down the larger of the two tunnels. We started to descend. The ground was hard stone littered with a layer of pebbles and dirt. Our footsteps crunched and echoed down the shaft. No matter how I stepped, I felt like I was creating far too much noise. Suddenly, Roger ducked and tumbled over onto his side. I jumped back and waved my light around. I couldn't see anything immediately threatening. Something grabbed my hair, Roger frantically whispered. I pointed my light up, twisting dark roots dangled from above. Sam shook her head. I helped Roger up off the ground and suppressed a laugh. Gradually, the tunnel began to curve. We came across a side passage, but it was caved in. We moved on. Shh, Sam said, and stopped without warning. We stood completely still, but couldn't hear anything. We waited for what felt like minutes. I wiped my nose on my sleeve. Roger adjusted his way to his other foot. And then the noise of something small and hard bouncing on stone reverberated through the tunnel. Roger gripped his rifle tight enough that I could hear the wood strain. We looked at one another. Sam put her finger to her lips and gestured down the tunnel with her gun. We continued moving forward. I had no idea how far the sound had traveled. Every little vibration seemed to be carried forever. The tunnel started curving more dramatically, but we continued to decline at a mild rate. We passed two more narrow passages. Barely wide enough for a single person, but Sam ignored them. We spotted something on the ground ahead of us. An old lamp rusted and shattered. We carefully avoided it and continued on until we arrived at a thin, rectangular chamber. Wide enough to accommodate three people abreast. Sam coughed into her elbow and made a disgusted sound. Even in the cold, he could tell that the room stank. I was reminded of the time when I declared several dead raccoons from an old chimney. 
I quickly glanced around the room with my light but could find no obvious source for the odor. Old mining equipment was piled nearly all the way to the ceiling in the corner closest to me. I explored down the right side of the room. Fragments of yellowed paper with hints of faded ink hung from the wall. Roger took out his flashlight and looked over the wall opposite, while Sam watched both the entrance and exit from her spot in the middle of the room. Um, what is that? Roger asked. Sam and I immediately turned towards Roger. Is it the fungus? Roger asked as he backed away towards me. A shaky light illuminated a section of the wall. There was a recess except it wasn't empty. The space was full from ground to ceiling. Some kind of fuzzy brown substance which reminded me of mold. Sam silently aimed her lighting gun at the oddity in the wall and slowly moved towards us. A shiver ripple over the brown surface, causing Sam to abruptly stop for a split second. And then she started shooting into the brown mass. In the enclosed space, these shots were deafening. My ears started ringing immediately. Roger dropped his flashlight and started fumbling with his rifle. I was confused. How would bullets help against a blob of fungus? The mass unfolded itself from the recess of the wall with a surprising speed. Long limbs appeared. The blob hit the ground and dirt fell down from the ceiling. It was a dang brown bear. I tried shooting but nothing happened. I remembered the safety, flipped it, and opened fire. The bear rushed Sam as she was reloading her pistol with a fresh magazine. She tried to dodge the attack but the bear connected with her mid-roll and she was sent flying into the wall. Roger was now shooting with his rifle but he wasn't getting any shots off due to having to operate the bolt. The bear turned on us as I ejected my first magazine. I had seen a few brown bears before and I knew something was wrong with this one. It showed no signs of animalistic fury. It made no sound. It looked floppy like something was wearing an oversized bear costume. It charged Roger and rolled over him. His rifle went flying. I backed up into the doorway and slid a new magazine into my gun. The bear ignored Roger and ran to me. I continued shooting as I retreated. One shot caught its shoulder and the bear stumbled just short of me. It recovered seconds later and swiped at me with heavy claws. I tried avoiding the attack and fell backwards. I hit the ground hard, and my flashlight went spinning out of reach. My gun bounced somewhere into the darkness. The bear loomed over me, and I felt my leg grow hot. I desperately tried scrambling away on my hands and heels, but it just turned away and ambled over to Roger, just as he was starting to get back to his feet. The bear pinned Roger to the ground with its front paws. Roger squirmed and kicked like a panicked animal. Get off me, he yelled. The bear ignored him and bit down on his shoulder. Roger screamed and flailed, but the bear was unshakable. I looked over to where I thought Sam should be. I couldn't see her very well. All I could see was a dark, unmoving shape at the base of a wall. Past Sam, movement caught my attention at the other entrance to the chamber. I thought I heard voices, but I couldn't be sure with Roger screaming and the ringing in my ears. Two figures stepped forward and I recognized one immediately. Paxton might have been even skinnier, but it was hard to say for sure, with our flashlights scattered all over the ground. It took me longer to recognize the other person. It was Judy, but thinner and with all the warmth missing from her face. The bear started dragging Roger by his shoulder and Roger hollered. He grabbed his hunting knife with his free arm and desperately tried stabbing the bear but the bear didn't even seem to notice. Paxton and Judy moved aside to allow the bear pass and Roger disappeared into the tunnel. Paxton and Judy walked over to Sam and hovered for a moment. I began searching around me with my hands, trying to find my gun in the dark. Judy bent down and reached out for something on the ground. She picked up something silver. Sam's gun. The entire chamber in the adjoining tunnel suddenly switched from black to blinding blue. I didn't understand what was happening. I had to shield my eyes from the light. Paxton and Judy started shrieking. I squinted over and Judy was partially engulfed in white, violent flames. She fell to the ground and started shaking madly. 
the overwhelming blue light seemed to be coming from within her hand. Paxton screamed something incomprehensible and seemed to regain some self-control. He watched Judy for a moment as she burned and convulsed. He looked around and picked up a melon-sized rock. I spotted my gun behind me and crawled over to it. I grabbed it and checked to see if it was loaded. The smell of smoke and cooking meat started filling the chamber. I tried aiming at Paxton, but the light was making my eyes water. He knelt down on Judy and tried restraining her. I fired a few shots at Paxton, but I couldn't tell if I was hitting him. He lifted the heavy rock and brought it crashing down. I fired at him once more. He lifted the rock again and again brought it down. The brilliant blue light retreated just as abruptly as it had appeared. Bright after images clouded my vision. I tried rubbing my eyes, but I was blind. A series of quick gunshots, which were not my own, suddenly erupted. I could hear hints of a struggle. Someone might have been screaming, but I'm not sure. A few more shots shook me, and then there was silence. I still couldn't see. My heart was pounding. A fuzzy light seemed to be moving. Without warning, something touched my shoulder. I flinched and covered my face. But a few seconds passed and nothing happened. I felt hands on me. Someone was trying to lift me up. The ringing in my ears started to subside. Dan, it's okay, Sam yelled. Sam, I asked in disbelief. Sam again tried getting me to my feet and this time was successful. I can't see, the light was too bright. No, it's okay, your eyes will adjust in a few minutes, Sam shouted. Stop shouting, I said. We have to help Roger. The bear, it dragged him away. None of this made any sense. Where the heck did that light come from? Look, it's complicated. B.S. Sam silently put a flashlight on my hand and walked away. My vision started to clear, at least, where I pointed my light. I saw a body on the ground and stumbled over to it. It was Judy. She had two perfect holes in her forehead, and a chunk was missing behind her left eye. The red from her face looked dark and oily. Her right arm was black and burnt and ended in a ragged point below the elbow. I looked around and spotted the charred remains of her forearm. It was still smoking. The residual heat around the body reminded me of the heat that I had felt in my leg. I looked down and inspected my thigh. There is no sign of red and thankfully I hadn't peed myself. Sam came over with her bag. I could see now that she had a cut somewhere hidden above her hairline. The right side of her face was a bright red. Are you okay? I'm fine. I destroyed the female vessel. Sam said and pointed at Judy. The man Paxton, I shot him a few times as he escaped. What? I shot and threw my arms up. What do you mean you destroyed the vessel and what about the light and fire? Look, we don't have time for this, Sam pleaded. Plus, you're not going to believe me anyway. We have to go help Roger. I groaned and kicked up a cloud of dirt. What about the rifle, I asked. Leave it, no point bringing something we can't use. We exited the chamber and followed the drag marks left behind by Roger. We rushed on the tunnel as quickly as we could, with our guns out and ready. Our lights bounced around in time to the crunch of our footsteps. There was no longer any point in trying to be quiet. We had long lost the element of surprise. Maybe we never had it to begin with. A little bit up ahead, the tunnel looked different and the wooden support beams disappeared. The ground was smoother and darker and sloped downwards in irregular waves. I could hear running water somewhere in the distance. I didn't know much about geology, but it was clear that the miners had found some kind of natural cave system. We carefully started to descend. I could see the tunnel widening around us, with smaller passages occasionally splitting off into unknown directions. I looked around and couldn't find Roger's trail. Crab, do you see anything? I asked. Sam looked around for a moment with her light. Yeah, over here. Sam illuminated an erratic trail of dark wet spots which led to a narrow side passage. We followed the oily spots to the entrance. Sam dropped her bag and we entered the new tunnel, but we couldn't move very quickly. It felt like we were being eaten by a stone snake. Are you sure this is the right way? I asked. 
I don't know how a bear would fit down here. Sam stopped ahead of me and looked back. You could be right. She reluctantly agreed. But we're following something and we can't afford to get flanked. We pushed deeper into the tunnel for another minute until Sam stopped again. Son of a... She shouted. I tried to peer around her to see what was going on. The way ahead tightened dramatically, forming an impasse for anything larger than a fox. It's wasting our time. The trail was a decoy, Sam said. I turned around and started making my way out of the tunnel as quickly as I could. Sam muttered something behind me. I was out of the narrow passage within a few minutes. Sam wasn't too far behind. My thigh was suddenly hot. I heard something and turned. Paxton swung at me but connected poorly with my shoulder, throwing me off balance. I fired my gun twice before slipping. One of the shots struck him in the calf. I toppled over onto my side and he stomped after me. His clothing was loose and filthy. He barely looked human. His skin was tight across his skull and his eyes were dark pits. His mouth was stretched open and full of teeth. My hands were shaking. I fired until my gun was empty, but I don't think anything connected. He smacked my gun away and lifted me from the ground. Sam exited the passage with her gun out and Paxton tossed me at her. She had no time to get ready. I crashed into her and we went tumbling down the tunnel a short distance. We landed apart. She was already back up on her feet when I looked over. Paxton jumped at her, but she rolled backwards and somehow used the momentum to launch him overhead down the tunnel. He crashed somewhere below us. Sam immediately started reaching for a gun with her light. I reached for my claw hammer, but it was missing. It must have slipped out when Sam and I were rolling, but I could see my flashlight up and across the tunnel. I started moving toward it. Paxton called out. You heard... His words echoed. Sam and I both ignored him. You missed them, uh, I know. Sam stopped looking for a gun. Join with me. You can see them again. My family's dead. Sam screamed into the darkness. And I'm going to kill you for what you did. I had almost reached my flashlight. A strange rhythmic sound rang out. I think it was laughter. It terminated in a number of dry coughs. I cannot die. I am like hunger and I will eat your tiny world. I reached for my light but was jerked backwards. Paxton wrapped his arms around me and squeezed. I yelped and squirmed and my legs started to burn. He tightened his arms around me. I heard a crack and felt something to my side move. I screamed and thrashed. I started feeling lightheaded. It was hard to breathe. Sam was suddenly somewhere nearby striking Paxton. He retaliated with a swift backhand which allowed me to free my right arm. The tension around me was quickly reestablished. Paxton's head was pressed tight against the side of my face. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the hot disc. I thrusted it backwards into Paxton's face and held it there like a brand. Like with Sam's gun, the disc immediately burst with bright blue light. Paxton fell backwards and I landed on top. He shrieked and fled below me as I fought to hold the disc in place. Bright white flames poured up and over me, but I couldn't feel them. The disc was strangely no longer hot against my hand. I started choking on the smoke. Sam pulled me away while Paxton continued to convulse. I looked over my body and was amazed that I wasn't on fire. I touched my face and head and everything seemed fine. Less than a minute after, Paxton stopped wailing. He stopped moving. Sam wrenched the disc free and the bright light immediately died. Once again, I couldn't see but I could now feel heat radiating from the corpse and could hear the snapping and popping of embers. I felt Sam sit down next to me. Is that your definition of blistering? I asked. Huh? In your car you said the disc would cause blistering, I explained. Sam laughed. I'm going to find our guns. Sam came back a few minutes later with our guns in her bag. I struggled to get back to my feet, but a sharp pain in my side I screamed no. I cried out and fell back to the ground. Let me see. Sam directed more than asked. She held her flashlight in her mouth and crouched down next to me. She unzipped my jacket and lifted my layers up. 
After a moment of study in my side, she poked me and I winced. You should be fine. Probably just a broken rib or two. I have something that will help. She pulled out a small white nasal spray from her bag. Here, she said and handed it to me. Take one spray now and maybe another in about six hours. I took the cap off and put the rounded nub in my left nostril and sprayed and snapped. Within a minute, I actually felt amazing. Once my vision was close to normal, we started searching for Roger. We explored the cave system as quickly as possible, but it was surprisingly vast. Slowly, my anxiety soured into despair. I guess my state of mind was obvious because Sam finally started opening up. So yeah, the whole fungus thing was a lie, she started. The things we're fighting is what you would have traditionally called a daemon. I looked at her critically, trying to judge whether or not she was serious. So we're fighting daemons now. Daemons exist, I asked in disbelief. Well, no, I mean, none of that stuff is real. That's why I said traditionally, she explained. Heaven, hell, angels, demons, spirits, it's all just stories. We stopped beside a still body of water that we had been circumnavigating for the past few minutes. Sam handed me water and I gulped half the bottle. But the things and places that inspired those stories and concepts, they do exist. And when you say places, I hesitantly asked other universes, other forms of reality. I didn't know what to say. We walked out in silence. We left the small underground lake behind and followed the converging tunnel. Ahead in the middle of the tunnel, a vague silhouette slowly became visible. As we got closer, our lights revealed the bear. We stopped a safe distance from the crumpled beast and it didn't react to our presence. Sam focused her gun on the animal and I swept my light around looking for a sign of Roger. I couldn't see anything else beyond the blob of brown fur. Maybe he's underneath, I offered. Sam pulled out the disc that I had used against Paxton and lobbed it onto the bear. Nothing happened. This is totally new, you know, Sam said. I didn't know what she meant. I've never heard of this entity using animals before. The nerds are going to be so excited. We approached the bear and I pocketed the disc, and then we rolled the limp carcass over onto its back. Roger, bloody and inert, lay in revealed space. I knelt down to take his pulse and I feared the worst. His jacket over his shoulder was torn and soaked. Even patches of his beard were stained red, but he wasn't cold, and after a few seconds I managed to find a pulse. I collapsed back at my butt and I smiled up at Sam. He's alive. Test him with a ward. With a what? Sam sighed. With the metal plate thing. Oh, I said and took out the desk. I touched it to his face and nothing happened. Well, that's a nice surprise, Sam said, but he doesn't look good. I'm going to rush ahead and disperse the stigma. She put up a hand, anticipating my confusion. The weak spot the entity was able to use. While I'm gone, see if you can patch Roger up for the return trip. Sam placed a few items next to Roger, including a small medical kit and took out a small handheld device. Hopefully I won't be long. Don't come looking for me or anything, just stay here with Roger. Sam grabbed her bag and jagged down the tunnel until she was out of sight. I looked at my watch and was surprised to see it was only a little past two. I opened the medical kit and got to work on Roger's shoulder. I didn't really know what I was doing, so I imitated what I had seen before in movies and shows. I cut away the jacket and found a lot of dried blood. I dumped half a bottle of disinfectant over the area, and he woke up screaming. It took me a few minutes, but eventually I was able to calm Roger. He didn't want any of my nasal spray, but he did swallow a few painkillers with some water. He had some first aid experience, and now that he was awake, he insisted on giving me step-by-step -step instructions. As I worked on his shoulder, I explained what had happened with Sam and me, but I didn't go into much detail. I didn't want Roger thinking I lost my mind. Roger needed a break before moving on to the gauze. He chugged the rest of his bottle of water and recounted how the bear had dragged him away. 
He had stabbed it dozens of times, maybe even hundreds of times, but nothing would stop it. Eventually, he must have just blacked out from the pain, because the next thing he knew, I was kneeling over him and his shoulder was on fire. Roger looked over at the bear and slowly got to his feet. I called out to him, but he neither didn't hear me or ignored me. He walked over and just stared down at it for a good while. He pushed it around with his foot and then picked something up. It was the hunting knife. He returned it to its sheath on his belt and came back over to where I was sitting. He was breathing hard and slow and his eyes were wet. It only took a few minutes to put the gauze in place and I then bandaged the area and then secured the arm in place with a few more passes of bandage. We didn't have to wait much longer before Sam returned. I didn't see any new injuries, but she looked pale and weak. She dropped her bag next to us and clumsily crashed down into it. Hey, Roger, good to see that you're awake, she said. My arm hurts like crazy, but um, better than being dead. I studied Sam and replayed the night over in my head. Maybe it was silly, but I felt obligated to verify that Sam was still Sam. Hey, Sam, I'm guessing you want this back. I asked and held out the metal disc to her. She smiled and took it from me without hesitation. Thanks. The work was done. Our return to the park truck was tedious but uneventful. I drove us back to Roger's cabin and parked between my truck and Sam's sedan. Sam helped Roger out of the truck and into her car. The two had argued nearly the entire drive back, but in the end, Roger had agreed to Sam driving him up to the hospital in Prince George. Sam dumped her bag into her truck and then handed me something small from her in her pocket. It was a cheap looking business card, which advertised some kind of trucking company. I gave her a questioning look. If I ever get tired of doing nothing in the middle of nowhere, give me a call, Sam said. Maybe I will, I said as I turned the card over in my hands. Sam started getting into the driver's side but then stopped. Oh, will the gas station be open right now? I immediately made the connection between Paxton and Judy. Oh crap. What's wrong? Sam asked. Judy, the woman from the mine, she works the night shift. I got into the back of the car and we drove towards the highway. Roger was already asleep in the passenger seat. We pulled into the gas station and were stunned by the unexpected result. Sam offered to help with the body in the U-Haul, but we didn't yet know about the husband but I wanted Roger to get proper medical attention as soon as possible. She recommended that I collect any security footage and suggested that I use the U-Haul to clean things up. Sam filled her tank and then disappeared north down the highway. I went inside the station and found the security tape recording machine in a cramped office in the back. I stopped the recording and ejected the VHS. Pancaked on top was a basic VHS player and a dusty old TV. I inserted the tape and skimmed the footage. The events unfolded in black and white, but all I could hear was the steady whine of the VHS player. I collapsed into the flimsy black office chair and spent a good while working through a fraction of the trauma of the night. I remember thinking that either I had alcoholism or a lot of therapy ahead of me. When I was able, I exited the station with the tape. I carefully picked up the severed arm and put it with the woman in the passenger seat. I backed the U-Haul to where the husband's body was hiding. I opened up the rear doors and moved some boxes around to make some space. I dragged the man from the trees and hefted him into the back. I searched around and eventually found the man's jaw tangled high up in a nearby tree. I was too tired to give a crap and I left it there. I returned to Roger's cabin in part. I wrapped Jessica in a blanket from a closet and carried her to the back of the U-Haul. I laid her down on top of the man and closed the doors. I wasn't sure what to do next, so I went back inside to think and made some instant coffee. I couldn't find any sugar, but I did find some milk. I filled the remainder of the mug so I could start drinking immediately. I was halfway finished with my coffee when I thought of an insane solution. I started the U-Haul and rolled down the driveway. The forest was still dark, but the promise of dawn was visible in the sky. The drive back up the logging road was chaotic. The boxes and items in the back clattered with frenzied enthusiasm as the truck bucked along the rough road. By the time I reached the summit, the overcast clouds had scattered and the sky was warming. I slowed but didn't stop. 
I guided the U-Haul between the two upright sides and followed the path of Paxton's truck. The truck seemed to be doing okay in the snow, but I maintained a slow and steady speed. I couldn't quite see the rock slide yet, but I wasn't too far away. Once the terrain to my right was sufficiently steep, I stopped. I maneuvered the truck so that it was perpendicular with the drop, but there wasn't enough room to get the angle perfect. I put the truck into neutral and opened the door. I jumped out and watched as the U-Haul slowly rolled away. The truck traversed the soft edge and picked up speed. It bounced down the embankment until about the halfway point where it caught the ground awkwardly and then somersaulted into the air. It crashed into the forest below and disappeared from view. The sun was just starting to peek over the Rockies. The horizon glowed with a furious orange which faded to a heartening blue elsewhere in the sky. I sat down in the snow near the drop and stared down into the forest until my butt was numb. No one was going to find the truck or the bodies for decades at a minimum. I pulled out the card that Sam had given me and played with it as the fresh morning wind rushed by. I held the card out to the wind, but I knew that I had no hope of going back to my previous life. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode. I hope you all enjoyed it wherever you are in the world. And as always, stay creepy.